Godzilla did not get nominated for Best Picture, and for that, I it got, for that reason, I, I, I got, will not be watching the Oscars. It got nominated for uh, special effects, I believe. It did. Yeah, which I'm like, on a $15 million budget, if they're like punching that far above their weight, mm-hmm. much respect to the man. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, a big, it's a big year for underdog productions made on shoestring budgets that produce really outsized results. Am I right? Pal World fan. Oh, there <laughs> is. That, I was there's the video game segue. Segue. Coming in. Brought it in. That's it. Very nice. Is this when the podcast <sighs> starts? <laughs> Do I start now? Yeah. And we're back with uh, another <laughs> no, another podcast. Hey, everybody. It's 2024. This is the Friends Per Second podcast. It's episode number 37, believe it or not. I'm Jake Baldino. That's Ralph, a.k.a. Skill Up. That's Lucy James. And we're here to talk about stuff. It's what we've been doing. Mm. It's what we're looking forward to doing in 2024. Uh, how are you guys doing? I'm really excited to be back, to be honest. Mm. Um I, as I've said on many occasions, don't do the holiday thing particularly well. I, um, you know, I, I'm, I get sort of like a bit stir crazy. I'm like, oh, w- wouldn't it be cool to like write up a quick script now? Or Such something? a hard you know what I mean? <laughs> No, that's not what I'm saying. But like, I just, I don't know. I just, I like this. I like this a lot. Mm-hmm. I like the podcast in particular. And, you know, it's nice to get back to it and, um, yeah, start getting back into this, getting back to the swing of things. Mm. It's been, it's been a long time off. You know, yeah. we've been gone for it a while. It has been. Lucy, how about it you? Have been. you have you done anything profound? No, God. I <laughs> <Good>. if anything, <laughs> devolved. Uh, <laughs> I, I if you think I sit like a shrimp at my desk, I have had such huge slug hours, I can <sighs> only call them on my couch. All right. This is a, this is a safe place. <laughs> My ass groove in my couch got so bad <laughs> that I had to like move where I sit in the couch. <laughs> just still remembering the Simpsons episode. That was me. On his ass groove. Yeah, that was nice. me. No, I just played That's a nice. bunch of video games. Not all of the ones that I really wanted to. That I said I was gonna. I was gonna watch. Uh, I was gonna play. I watched some movies. I spent a lot of time hanging out with my friends. I cleared out a bunch of stuff, which I was pretty happy with because i've been meaning to do a big clear out i'm still not there like you can see all the tchotchkes behind me i still have too much stuff but i moved things around a little bit made the space more comfortable so i think i had a good break but uh i'm i I just definitely hibernated a little bit i slept a lot it was nice that's good good. that is good i did catch up on sleep actually i actually did use my time uh, as in productively on my holidays like personally productively mm. i did actually like see my friends spend time with family i did go outside i did get back to the gym for the first time Whoa. properly in a long time which is big nice. it's big it's a big move uh and i'm still there thankfully mm-hmm. i don't know how long february will february probably will shatter that change that yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'll just as i as i recommence work on my own ass groove uh i'll be back in back in it but um you moved your camera angle but- I did. Well, we had a whole bunch of technical mm-hmm. issues and so change of scenery mm-hmm. and now you get to see the top of my head. There you go. You're welcome. Um but no, it was a good it was a good holiday and I really yeah, I did I did enjoy it for sure. For sure. And I also played some games that a little bit of backlog stuff, mm-hmm. which I guess we'll talk about later. But mm-hmm. how about you, Jake? What'd you do, man? I played one video game. I played well, what I played two. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's Tony it. Hulk. I didn't do anything. Wait, wait, wait. Which, which which games are these? Um, well, one of them was just like a recent one. It was the God of War, okay. uh, Valhalla sure. DLC mm-hmm. that I talk. Sure. I'll talk about. Uh, and then it was Tony Hawk. Yeah. Mm. And you know, whatever. Got to do what you got to do. Uh, totally. No, I I kind of was still working on finishing the house and all the you know renovation stuff we've had going on. So it's kind of like putting my life back together and putting things in shelves and cabinets and stuff and that's really boring that's not good listening so let's just uh let's just <laughs> let's just jump if we, could, if, we could, if we could see the cabinet if i could see mm-hmm. all of the stuff that you got in that little glass cabinet there i think it'd be very exciting no i take us on a tour i think it. like i like that so lucy went from shrimp to you said slug to slug yeah. i feel like this is i'm coming on my clam era i'm just gonna like turn into i'm gonna shell up and just get inside there that's gonna be me <laughs> 
Yeah, mm. you heard it here first. I'm folks. Entering my clam era. <laughs> so yeah. uh, let's just talk about stuff. We got a lot this podcast episode. Mm. Uh, it's definitely going to be the gang. It's us. No special guests. No nothing. Just us. The games we're looking forward to. Uh, the games that we've played. We have to catch up on and a bunch of user questions. We got some cool stuff. So uh, let's just kick it off. Uh, yeah. Games we're looking forward to in 2024. This is a massive one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a big topic. It's one that's been discussed, but I, I definitely want to hear uh, from you guys a little bit more. We have a lot of games that we all kind of have going back and forth. So maybe I'll start. Uh, uh, I have a question. Actually, I have a question to start. A question. Mm-hmm. Question. Do you guys overall think that 2024 is going to be as big as 2023 was? Please say no, because I can't handle another 2023. Oh, as in release-wise? <laughs> as in release-wise, yes. I think there's still going to be some bangers, but I think 2023 was such a particular case of everything falling because of in on each other because of COVID and sure. everything. I, I think 2024 is going to be still busy, but not as busy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely see last year be... It's hard to like follow up a, a historic year. Like there are years in old gaming history where, you know, it was a massive year with like back to back incredible games. And then a year after that, it feels like a lull. I think now with the way the cadence of releases are, you know, even a little bit before pandemic is that like we're still going to have a lot of good consist- consistent games to check out mm. and talk about, but not as many like staggering smash hit awesome incredible things back to back you, you know mm, i do yeah a steady diet Not, if you will i think so yeah like a regular year as opposed to last year but even the year before then because year 2022 there was still like the post covid release you know where mm. like stuff that should have come out earlier was starting to come out like 2022 it still felt like was a pretty big year but 2023 was just absolutely nuts and yeah it's gonna be mm. weird to get back to what feels like a normal cadence of releases and I don't know, because I'm looking at February, and February is obviously huge, mm-hmm. for sure. But after that, the rest of the year is pretty cruisy, broadly speaking. Like, I think, you know, I mean, I sense. think, you know, we're, there'll probably be a Nintendo Direct, there'll probably be a PlayStation Direct, Xbox just had theirs. Sure. Uh, then we'll have Summer Game Fest and Gamescom, and every, I think releases will start to trickle out there. There's, if you go on, you know, uh, any website, GameSpot, Game Informer, whoever, they always have, like, games in 2024, and... Yeah. Very, very few of them will have dates. And then at the bottom, it's just yeah, like unannounced. all of these yeah, unannounced sure, sure. dates ones. So I'm really hoping that the calendar fills up because, yeah, beyond <laughs> like end of March, I think you can count on two hands the stuff that has release dates. Sure. I guess what well, there will be a Nintendo Switch 2 this year, right? It I, feels like it. I feel... Yeah. I, I mean... Something changing in the water, definitely. Yes. It's like, ah, uh, <clears throat> Luigi is... Coming back from cryo sleep or something. I don't know. I didn't want to say Mario because everyone always says Mario. Wake you if you need, if you when you need me. Except it's in Luigi's voice. (laughs) Someone do that. I can't do it. It's gonna fail. Look in the mirror and Um, say my name three times, and I'll come. Yeah. Um, Uh, Yeah. No, I, I think. I think the Switch 2 is probably inevitable. I mean, Nintendo were like swearing black and blue. Like, no, we haven't showed the fucking thing. And it's like, yes, you have. Everyone, like all the reports from last year saying that it was like hands-on at mm-hmm. Gamescom, there was too many of those reports and too they're too well-sourced for that to not be true. And Nintendo were out here like, no, no, it wasn't. And they're just obviously keeping very tight lip because they want to keep selling the current Switch. But, you know... That machine is fucking old now. It is an old machine Seven and it years. is time for a new one and everything's lining up. Like all the leaks about panel manufacturers and how they're like, oh, we're, we're expecting a bumper year from our console business. Which console? Uh. Oh, we, we can't say. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're very excited to release a seven inch LCD screen en masse <laughs> in 2024 to an uh, un- unnamed, uh, you know, whatever. An unnamed so. Japanese uh, developer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which, okay, so say the Switch 2 comes out this year what are you hoping will launch with it i reckon absolutely nothing will launch with it except for 
remasters of like Tears of the Kingdom and maybe a new Mario game if we're really lucky, but even then probably not. not I reckon Metroid it's Prime just four. That's for, that's for Yeah, no, game. nothing, nothing. I really believe because I think Nintendo usually have like one marquee launch title that they go with for a console and they have like nothing else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which I think is kind of standard for most consoles really when you think about it. But um Cause Switch, I definitely don't expect Mario. Switch launched with Breath of the Wild and then a, a, a little bit later was Mario, was it? Yeah, Mario was uh, like October, a... right? So like six months later. Yeah, six months later. Yeah, yeah. Which is still a killer, like first you know oh, couple yeah. of months for a console. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not expecting expecting much from a Switch Two in terms of launch library. Um, I really want a sequel to Super Mario Odyssey. I loved that game. Hmm. Sure. And I really, I really liked it. And then, I but then, but no. then I, but then I didn't go and play what was it, Bowser's Fury or whatever. I was just like, no. Give me Cappy or give only. me death. <laughs> I like, Wait, I did like... you play Wonder? You know, I didn't. I only played a oh. little bit of PAX. I know. Damn. I don't like you're fun. You're really missing out. Yeah, I didn't you either. You clearly did not like <laughs> I don't fun. like whimsy or fun. Yes. No, I just, yeah. I just didn't get around to it. Like, the end of last year was so relentless. Well, that's the beauty that. of even, like, I've been saying to people with with the such an impact that last year made, it, like, has ripple effects into this year because, like, you know, we can only play so many games that were yeah. in 2023. So 2024 is when they'll trickle in. That's when I'll find maybe a minute for Mario Odyssey or uh, insert a million other games that I can't think yeah, of. Yeah, I played Armored Core over the break. Yeah. Or like, mm. some of it, at least. And I'm still sort of plugging away at that. And um, yeah, it's that I will continue to do that. There's so many games on my, on my what do you call it, pile of shame from 2023. Mm. That yeah, you know, when things do calm down in March, that that's the plan, you know, to to go back and one day play the whole Yakuza series from start to oh, finish, four hundred plus hours, baby, let's go. Did you put out a video on Armored Core? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, I, put, I did a preview, so I did a preview. I oh, did, from back I, I did the yeah, preview yeah, block right. back then, and uh, yeah, I liked it. Well, I guess we'll talk about it later. We we'll talk about what we're playing, yeah. but um. Yeah, but I agree. There's, there's twenty three still has many gifts to give mm-hmm. because there was no way we could have opened them all last year. It's so. a good way of saying it. <laughs> mm, thank you. Profound. Just came up with that right then. There we go. You're welcome, Hallmark. All right. So, uh, with the games we're looking forward to for twenty twenty four, we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth. Mm-hmm. There's, a, we all have big long lists. Uh, yeah. So, Lucy, would you like to go first? So the first one I picked is one that's actually out now that I have downloaded is Portal Revolution. So a bunch of folks made 40 free new portal test chambers. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know that much more about it because that sold me already. <laughs> so I downloaded it, but I haven't had the chance to play it just yet. I really loved Portal 1 and Portal 2. And actually when my dad, my dad's kind of getting into gaming and really yeah. was that like the first time hang on a second no pause. no not the first this... time he's he's getting back into gaming he kind of oh right he was he was really big into doom quake tomb raider worms x-wing versus tie fighter like my dad had he had, he had taste pretty, cool. pretty great taste uh, yeah he knows what he was doing and then we played some 007 nightfire um, Ooh, okay <laughs> then, but sure. now recently he got a pc and he was asking me for games that are like mist and uh riven and so Ooh, that's i a recommend... true dad if i ever heard oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, huge yeah, yeah. Dad what, did, energy what did you say what did you say what did you say talos principle Hell the yeah. room uh yeah. and i also recommend a portal so sure. i really hope that that um that would that would be cool i think great picks i mean the whole walking simulator genre is like a Mm -hmm. is a thing now like you know there's like a million games he could play if he's really into that shit yeah and he loves he loves puzzles like no way i I haven't you know what i haven't got him onto nyt connections yet which is that (gasps) you should Boys. Yeah, oh, hang on. A, New, York, New, York, no, sorry. New York Times. I know, New York Times. Yeah, sure, sure, uh, sure. I forget that there's this entire gaming ecosystem on the New York like, Times. They have over that's actually people. how that it's actually props up their business at this point more yeah. than the newsroom. That is what keeps the New York Times alive. The fucking crossword. And Lucy you know? is the <laughs> Lucy, Lucy is, is the their target of that. I may She's have like a Googling subscription. It now, like, I may have a yeah. subscription. <laughs> no, uh, and I think he would love that because he loves watching panel shows and and university challenge which is an actual tv show in the uk it's panel show where it's like everybody's oh, more... sitting around and they say funny things yeah so he loves panel shows but he also <laughs> loves the quiz shows and there's there's kind of a thing in the uk where you have that that particular 
time slot where you have R Richard Osman's House of Games or and that's a lot of wordplay, only connect, which is what connections ripped off and university challenge like my dad is a is this fan. at like 10 30 p.m at night no dude like... this is prime time 8 p.m no way <laughs> yeah really? okay that's yeah. pretty cool bbc2 like prime time that's better than like real housewives of mm -hmm. yorkshire or something yeah <laughs> i don't know wait bbc2 is that like mtv2 like how many bbcs are there <laughs> B okay so there's so bbc1 bbc2 itv channel 4 channel 5 and those are your terrestrial channels. And then when we went digital, terrestrial, a few oh, okay, years. Right. So like, if you if you had a TV back in the day before everything was digital, what sure. was it? Oh shit! What was it called? There was a phrase for when it went digital. It, it'll come back to me. But those are the five channel channels you would have unless you had Sky, which is our cable. And so, that, those are big shows that like everyone watches. Like Bake Off's on Channel Four. Um, the Traitors is on BBC. Traitors, by the way. Oh my god, what a show! I know you haven't been watching it, but it is Among Us. I have no idea what it is. It is Among Us, but in a Scottish castle, and it's phenomenal. Okay. Wait, is it is it a reality thing or is yes. it is it? So it is. It started out in the Netherlands, and then the UK version is normal people, and then the American version is hosted by Alan Cummings, and it is all kind of the Real Housewives, B tier celebrity kind of things. But the sure. the British one. Oh my god, because sometimes they'll have... So in the first season, they had a married couple. One of them was like a magician. Uh, in this season, <laughs> they've had a... Was it Randy Pitchard? Was it Randy Pitchard? <laughs> no, I wish. Um, they... He's the only magician I know. There was a clairvoyant. And they all have to pick who they think is going to be the traitor. And then they have these incredible round tables where they all just yell at each other and accuse. <laughs> it's, it's incredible TV. I know this episode, okay. this episode in particular is not sponsored by the VPN, but the VPN... <laughs> like I use, that's Damn what I it. use mine for. <laughs> this was a chance. Yeah. That's so funny. Okay, right, so cool. Portal Revolution. Portal Revolution, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it right back. Bringing Looking it right forward back. to that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. They've totally. had success in the past. Uh, just like a few years ago, two years ago or so, uh, a Portal, another por Portal fan made thing came out. And yeah. I played that for Game Ranks and it was fantastic. So. Yeah, I'm excited to get back in the, in that world. Yep. Ralph, what do you for got? Sure. Um, I'm really keen for Helldivers. Helldivers oh. 2. Um, I love its uh, Starship Troopers energy. Mm. I just rewatched that the other night. God, it holds up super oh, well. Yeah. Not as strong as, obviously, Total Recall or Robocop, no. but it definitely has its charms. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. Like it's, it's, a, it's a Sony game that's getting released on PC at the same time as the console, so that's, like, pretty big for them. Um... It just looks like a fun time. You know, I'm just, I'm down for the sort of like arcade silliness of it all. I think it just looks pretty fun. Um, so yeah, Helldivers 2 is definitely on my, I, I'm not expecting it to be incredible, but I'm expecting to have a good time in co-op. That's mm -hmm. the goal, you know? Did you play so the first I'm one? Actually, no. I, well, I did, but only like a very brief. Like yeah, I reckon same. I put a total of 45 minutes into that tops, you know? Same. This and looks so I think way the more fact, up my alley. This is, yeah, well, I like the twin stick top down thing, right? I don't even know why I didn't stick with it. I just didn't. It just obviously there's a lot to, lots to play, but this one I think has really captured that the perspective shift is cool. Obviously more ambitious, but I think they're also leaning more into that like Starship Troopers thing. Um, maybe the first game was also doing that. And I wasn't really paying enough attention to it, but this even with the marketing, some of the trailers they're putting out is really just like channeling a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really keen. I think that looks really interesting. I'm down. Uh, one of my big ones is Frostpunk Two. Mm. Uh, I love me a city builder kind of Civ type planny game, and I love the first Frostpunk so much. And this new one, I don't know too much about it. I've only been following it kind of like from the outside because I don't want to like you know. Uh, they just released a trailer for it recently that like shows actual gameplay visuals, but the trailer is edited so well. I said this on the Friday show, the new show, but like. This trailer just shows it perfectly articulates the feeling of playing the original Frostpunk, like how stressful and anxiety inducing it is and how just awful and depressing it is. Uh, so it, it made me really excited for the second one. Um, it's for those of you that don't know, it's essentially like a, you know, like you're like the government overseer, like looking down on a city that you build out, but it's uh, Snowpiercer basically where it's like the world is trapped in an arctic like hell uh, future 
and you need to worry about like keeping the heat on, keeping everybody fed Mm -hmm. and keeping everybody not from freezing to death. And you are constantly faced with like these brutal decisions where it's like, do you make the kids work in the mines to keep the, you know, <laughs> to keep the, the city safe or like, you know, so, and every single decision is like agonizing and brutal. And it really shows like, in my opinion, like the, 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 you know, the challenges and tribulations of leadership, obviously in a big scale, but it's just so smart the way it does it. And the new trailer for the new one got me really excited. It seems like they get it and they're doing more, of what's good so yeah i'd say just check out that trailer like look up frost punk 2 gameplay yeah. trailer it's it's cool i did see that but yeah. i haven't seen the trailer yet so yeah it does a lot of a lot of hype behind that one though like mm-hmm. a lot of people really love that first one and yeah i'm i'm very keen for that as well it's rough it's like one of the hardest games i've ever played but like in a different hard way as in like, difficulty hard as in like this the feeling of like yeah like watching a curb your enthusiasm episode where you're just like oh god i don't know how much more of this i can yeah. take kind of yeah. thing yeah right okay yeah like it's Got just it. it's just it's not like oh i didn't dodge roll at the right time it's more like you know, <laughs> like this sure. is brutal and i'm sad <laughs> <laughs> nice perfect lucy you got perfect. another one I am very much looking forward to Open Roads, which is... So tell me about this. What is that? Like, I've heard chatter about this. So they just had a preview uh, lo- uh, lift, and so there's been a lot more chatter about it. It is the new game from... Uh, so it was originally Fulbright, uh, and after all of the kind of allegations that came out about folks working there, uh, sure. I believe this team has now separated completely. I just checked on Steam, and it now just says Open Roads team as the developer instead of Fulbright. But it's basically a, uh, so there is, it's a mother-daughter road trip game. And Mm. it all comes about because there's a a mysterious box of family junk in the attic, which every time I go home, I always flick through like all the old photos, all the old notes, everything that my mom has kept or like my stepdad had. And so I love that tactile-ness of going through everything. And so this is basically a game where they've, they kind of maybe uncover a dark mystery and then the mother daughter go on a road trip to kind of get to the bottom of everything. That's as much as I know about the story because that's basically all you had to tell me to sell me on it. I, you know, grew up with mostly with my mum. Like I wouldn't see my my dad uh, every day. Like I saw him every other weekend. And so a lot of it is just like me and my mum. And so I'm very interested to see a game that tells a mother daughter story rather than I feel like we've had a lot of sad dad stories. Yes, that's very true. And I'm very really true. excited to see how that because I think mother daughter relationships are so complicated. Like <laughs> I uh, talking to you know my fe- <laughs> yes, they talking are. to my female friends, talking to uh, my friends who are mothers now, and it's you know it's it's really tricky. Like my my sister has two daughters, and you know they're incredible now but she's like i really worry that you know when they're teenagers they're gonna turn against me (laughs) so i'm really i'm really intrigued by this one i think the problem is the timing on when it's coming out it's like february 22nd is it really yeah that sucks that's a bad date for any game to release because it's like five other games releasing that same day Mm -hmm. so i will definitely carve out time for that one because i like the um this is the one i i had to like i was like oh yeah this one Mm. specifically because it's got like hand-drawn characters autumnal or like seemingly vibes. a look of that but then they're in like a rendered 3d game world and i just think it's a it's a cool look yeah it, it looks great um like i really enjoy the art style very distinct and like i said very very autumnal and so hmm. yeah i'm excited for that one. great word autumnal yeah. don't get many chances to use it do, do, what's it's the american word. version fall tumnal <laughs> <laughs> we say autumn- fall-ish <laughs> do we say autumnal i don't know what we say <laughs> yeah we say yeah, it's yeah, giving fall i don't oh know it's, what, what did you it's say giving- what did you just say <laughs> it's giving it's fall. giving fall it's know. giving <laughs> fall <laughs> holy fuck oh god <laughs> um Ralph okay Harris. speaking speaking of driving mm. uh another road trip game but of a hey. different variety is pacific drive mm-hmm. um so i did a preview for this one actually a little while ago i watched and, it um, very good mm, it's very cool like it's a very very cool game if anyone is unfamiliar with the um concept it's like some you're in this zone and this zone is very fucked up you're not meant mm-hmm. to be there it's been walled off something terrible has happened there and there's lots of freaky paranormal shit going on like weird 
enemies that look like half-life enemies patrolling around and weird structures and artifacts and all sorts of stuff right and uh you are in a car basically so you can get out of this car like you're a person but the main thing that you're doing is you're taking this car out into little expeditions to collect resources to take back to your garage so you can upgrade your car and you can go further and look deeper and deeper into this zone. So it's a survival game. It's got some like uh, subnautica kind of vibes in terms of the, you know, the mystery of it and the, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was just fantastic really from, I mean, I, I put a couple of hours into probably three to four hours and in every minute it was just totally hooking me you know the setting was brilliant the the car handling mechanics were so shit but like in exactly the right way like they should be because you drive in this really shitty jalopy um yeah the story was being really well told Mm. you can like there was just or so much variety in terms of the creepy shit that you were finding a lot of the enemies don't really try and hurt you as much as they just try and fuck your shit up so there's one floating enemy and it doesn't hurt you, but what it does is it just, just like, like has you. this, it just drags your car. So yeah. it just has this magnet thing that just grips onto your car and it just goes whoop and it just tries to fling your car somewhere. And you're like, well, that's annoying because now you've fucking flicked my car off, <laughs> off a cliff. I need that car, you know? That's my um, car. Yeah. So it's just very interesting and it looks really well made. It does look maybe a little, like it looks quite demanding as a survival game. Like there's definitely a lot of resource gathering and all yeah. that sort of stuff, which I know a lot of people bounce off that. But um, yeah, definitely from what I played the preview, I'm like very keen on it. And it too is out on February 22nd. Mm-hmm. The, the only the only is- issue I have with that game, because I also played the demo, is that oh, you did. that font. That font. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The UI sucks. Yeah, it sucks I was big time. It's it's because yeah. it's so demanding in terms of giving you things to look at, and yes. there'll be things where you have to replace a very particular part of the car, maybe. Uh, the left door or something and then you have to go into the crafting menu and it's like that's all fine but because the font is that kind of old school what's the topography like ASCII the ASCII yeah. kind of that I know what you mean it yeah. is sure. so maybe this is just me I can't pass it very easily and so I would <laughs> yeah, find myself yeah. in those menus just pouring over everything trying to figure out what I was looking for because even when they highlight stuff it wasn't as I agree eye-catching as it should have been for me to be able to navigate there easily and yeah there's there's a lot of that a lot of that font there's a lot going on definitely it definitely sucked when i and the preview i was like yeah this this is not good but (laughs) so i don't know they really can't change that prior to launch but maybe they can change it in some like later patches and tighten it up or whatever it didn't ruin the experience for me by any means but it was definitely something that i was like oh okay that's a bit of a bummer and that's the thing like once i got into it and i was a couple hours in and i kind of knew basically where more things were living and sitting i was going okay this is fine i can kind of deal with this but then there's also such a huge amount of upgrades to unlock and stuff and i was like oh man if i wasn't taking my time to read every single one of these i'd be pretty lost but this is very fun yeah i just like games about like i I just like fucked up cars in general and like so (laughs) i like it for that and i i I played it at a preview thing like a year ago and i I like placing things on the car it felt very intuitive and it felt very good to like oh i need i'm going to do this so i need to put this on the car and i need to you know very interesting stuff uh for me another one i have it's a big question mark next to it wolf among us 2 oh really so new telltale is that this year is it that game exists it was is that happening they let go of half of telltale they did yeah and then telltale said no it's still we're still working on it like don't don't worry so (laughs) i i don't know i we maybe (coughs) this year it's an it's a question mark it's a question mark i have like a question mark list too the other one is vampire the masquerade bloodlines 2 that seems Ooh, a. Like, I'd love to see that this year. It, it, maybe this year. Uh, I don't, isn't I don't that know. like? Have they like not re-revealed that after they changed developers? I thought oh. it was at PAX. Wait, am I am I conf- I'm confusing a different va- vampire game? Because there was another. No, it might vampire. be. Bloodlines Two is the one is now Chinese. No, the va- is, it, is, there, is there's Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah, there's Vampire the Masquerade, right? And that was the one that were people wanting Vampire the Masquerade 2. And then that got stuck in development hell and got taken off. Bloodlines That's the 2. one, right? Yeah. But is it Bloodlines? But isn't Bloodlines a different one? Well, then there's Blood Hunt. Oh, God, it's so annoying. Like Vampire like a, the Masquerade Blood, Bloodlines. Bloodlines like, 2 is the one that got rebooted and it's now being yes. made by the Chinese room. Yes. 
that's the one that's I'm looking forward to. That's the one I'm looking forward to. Because they've okay. they've also got um, Still Wakes the Deep coming out. I think this year, which is that that looks pretty sick. The under what the nautical up oil I, tanker yes. game. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep, survival horror on an oil tanker for sure. That definitely makes a lot of sense. I can see it. Yeah, okay. those, those are two of my big question marks. Both but, slated uh, for twenty twenty four. Yeah, Lucy, what do you got? Yep. Uh, other games I'm looking forward to. I think it's pretty obvious to say Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. That tiny franchise no one's ever heard of. Because <laughs> um, I never played the original Final Fantasy VII. Oh. So I know one thing. Actually, I know two things <laughs> about the rest of it. So it's, I know I know the big beats as they were in Final Fantasy VII original. I'm just really excited to see what they do with it. I played the preview from when we all met in, in September. And mm. it was good to be That's back right. in in that world and with those characters yep. and so they just they just had a hands-on yeah did they did they did yeah um everyone was in la posting pics with uh the big the buster, buster swords. Swords. and the, also like the and... acting the acting talent was there and oh really yeah matt cool. mercer and everyone was down there brianna white sure and i'm and the, the devs obviously i uh i'm excited to go back i the thing is i just i really hope i have time to replay remake but yeah, it was good, but this is like where I feel like this one is where like at least like in, in the context of the original Final Fantasy VII, like this is where things get a little like bigger and crazier mm. and more interesting. So I'm like more excited for this one than I was for remake, even though we didn't really know totally where remake would end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now knowing where it's going, I'm I'm really in. The the first one though, the remake was essentially a dating simulator, like it was, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and this one, this next one, Rebirth can't be that because there's just too much other shit going on at that point, you know. But what, what I mean? about and so my girl Tifa? Well, I'm, you'll be hanging out with her, okay. but I don't think it'll be quite the same courtship. So, yeah. uh, I think it's gonna have a very different. It's gonna hit very different, I think. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to that as well for sure. Um. One I definitely want to put on people's radars is another survival game. I can't believe this is a crazy month for survival games, by the mm. way, because there's Enshrouded, which we'll talk about later on, and because I've been playing through that lately. There's Pal World, which we'll talk about later for a variety of reasons. Uh, there's Pacific Drive, and then there's Nightingale. So Nightingale mm. is a game from a bunch of former Bioware developers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they left the studio to set up their new thing, and um, yeah, it's it's looking really interesting basically it's 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 a more story focused take on the survival genre it's got the whole like lamp lit theme i think is what they're calling mm-hmm. it these days where it's like ye olde victorian times and you know like oh, muskets and top hats right. or something and i think it, I, I remember he's seeing it called like lamp lit era lamp lighter is it uh gas punk gas gas yeah. punk yeah actually that code that also kind of works um but it's really, yeah, it's just looking really strong and it's on Unreal Engine 5, so it looks very pretty. Um, it's got a really interesting system going on with like cards where you kind of step into realms and the the, cir- the, the, the realms can have modifiers based on cards that you drop mm-hmm. before you step into them. So one of them can be raining and one of them can be, I don't know, full of really dangerous enemies and all this sort of stuff. Um, but I'm just keen to see a bunch of Bioware developers tackle the survival genre and try and bring some more story to it because broadly speaking that is not a genre that has handled story mm. particularly well or even cared about it with the exception of like i don't know what subnautica the long dark that's about all i can think of you know mm. so yeah nine gal that also is out on february 22nd if you can believe it I so <laughs> i just don't understand why publishers do like i don't understand why everyone does this like we just i don't get it it was it's been the same for the last like three years running where february just becomes this dumping ground and i don't get why but it's just it's because because no one has money in january because of the holidays sure they're like oh everyone's back to wanting to spend stuff in february but like just put it in march then you get some like a bit of a bit of space everyone has some time to think Mm. i don't know what do you do so yeah martin girl that's uh it's 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 looking interesting Mm. also i looked it up it's gas lamp fantasy there it is okay it was the yeah got it okay fair enough fair enough sometimes yeah. when i go to the bathroom i have a gas lamp fantasy 
Excuse me. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I, just, I don't think we want to know what that means. <laughs> I'm just, Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm just workshopping. I'm a little off my game. I'm a little rusty. In a couple of weeks, it'll be recorded. I have to sell this podcast in a paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Uh, okay. Another All one right. I have on my list More is a, a little one. It's Little Nightmares 3. Uh, because I like those games. I like that genre where you're like a little guy running in a big graphics world, usually from left to right. I don't know what you call it. Uh, but you know, inside limbo, the little nightmares yeah. games. I like I, I like the specific... the little guy genre. Little, it's the little, <laughs> little guy. guy genre. Little guy walks yeah. left to right yeah. genre. Yeah. <laughs> Mario. And it's artsy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, Little Nightmares 3 is gonna be interesting because it's a different studio this time around. Oh. Uh, oh, is it? It is not Tarzier. It's actually the people who uh, uh, did Until Dawn and 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 stuff oh, like that. Um, uh, Supermassive. Supermassive. Yeah. Is that super? It's or them. Is it really? Sumo? Is it wait, Sumo or Supermassive? N- wait, now I'm like, wait. Yeah, I'm second guessing my facts. Hang on, because Su- right. Supermassive has got uh, that one that was at the Game Awards. It is Supermassive. You're right. Wow. It is Supermassive. It is, yeah, which is like what? So like, it's good. So it's big. a good pair up. Um, but I, I, I was like, oh man, I like the original team. But what again, they if working? they were replaced by anybody, I think this is a good move. So sure. Yeah, mm. not really too much to say about. So wait, why, it. We just what, know it's coming in 2024. Just, do you know why they were replaced? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know the story. But then maybe I hope it's because they're working on something else. Like they can entrust the franchise to Supermassive, and they are clearly really talented. So like whatever they are doing, I am I am on board for that as well. Yeah. Did you guys know that there's a Terminator RTS coming out next month? Yeah, I've been having a problem with this one because it's called Dark Fate, which is like a bad movie. Yeah, that's um, that's not the Christian Bale one, is it? No, that's no, red. That's, that's red. What's that one? No, Terminator Dark Fate was the one where it's like John Connor got murdered the at the end of one. Terminator Two. That was the new. The, oh, Dark the new Fate, one. Dark yeah. Fate was so bad that I have Eternal Sunshine it from my memory. Uh, that's I right, saw I that remember. in the cinema. What, who was it? I don't who was in that? that oh, it's, Genesis it's the one. Was worse. Oh, God, I couldn't finish. Genesis, Genesis was worse. Genesis. Dark Fate is the one where. Uh, Linda Hamilton comes back, right? Yes, yes. exactly. The only it was a part. terrible film. The part at the beginning, though, was really funny. It's like I think if they just like straight up murder John Connor on a beach or something, and it's and like it, and he's, he's, that's um, it. They've used the weird CG on his face. Have they? Like, okay, yeah, right. he's like, so deep. funny when the actor What's... like leading up to that movie. The actor Eddie Furlong was like, "Yeah, I'm in the movie," and they're like, "What? You're crazy. You're not even an actor anymore." He's like, "I'm in the movie. You'll see." And everybody's like, "What does that mean?" And now, <laughs> Mackenzie Davis, I remember um, was was good in that. Like, she's she uh, was good. Yeah, she was good in it. And Gabriel Luna too. And but he was, was kind just... of scary. Yeah. But that was it. Anyway. I, I remember when they fought in the factory, and I don't remember anything else. So was the yeah. game going to be good? Well, that's the thing. Because I'm like hoping. Because we had the last Terminator game from Taeon, and then we had the Robocop game. So I'm secretly hoping that there's like. I know this is a totally different developer, don't get me wrong. Mm. But I'm just secretly hoping that maybe there's like a surprise underdog thing going on here where like this studio really understands the source material and they just nail it because i can totally see and uh, first of all there aren't many rts games these days mm-hmm. right so it's nice to get one and secondly it's a terminator thing i can see that totally working in terms of the two factions and how that would work like that makes a lot of sense to me and if they have a lot of respect for the source material and they know how to do it well it could be fun you know and i it's been so long since i played an rts i i don't think i can remember the last time i actually played one and so I'm like, yeah, I'll give this a crack. Why not? I just, you know, play some Terminator RTS and then that'll be that. So I'm I'm not expecting much, but I'm hoping it surprises me. That's where I would put a categorize that one. Lucy, w- yeah. what's next for you? I again, I'm looking very uh in the near near sightedly. Uh, I'm really excited for Persona 3 Reload. I need to. Fi- I'm I'm so close to the end of Infinite Wealth, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But I am not letting myself chain. Uh, I'm not letting myself double up on 80 plus hour RPGs from sure. Sega. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> um, so I I'm not as familiar with Persona 3. Uh, I loved four, 
loved Golden, loved Persona 5, loved Royal. Three, though, is the one that a lot of my big Persona friends are saying it has the best story. It's definitely the more kind of... It's definitely very dark. I remember when I played, I played like 10 hours of it or something, like back when Can't I went... can you like shoot yourself in the head? Yeah, to, like, you summon use... Your it's persona? with the invoker <laughs> instead of a gun, it, but it looks like you shoot yourself in the head. It's kind of messed up. And so played a little bit That's at Gamescom like in... last year and it handles really nicely, like very indicative, evocative, evocative, sorry, of Persona 5. They've definitely taken a lot of cues in there, apparently a lot of nice quality of life adjustments. And I'm, I'm ready to hear that soundtrack that everyone adores. Oh, is it meant to be really, really good, mm. isn't it? Okay. Well, I mean, they're always good for Persona games, so that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, I wish I had time. At, at this point, I know that most JRPGs, I like, I would love to play through them, but there's like 80 hours and it's like, oh man, this is, I don't have time for that right now yeah. which i'm bummed about um the thing is for me my repetitive strain is so bad that i actually really like having turn-based rpgs sure. because i don't have to like i can play yakuza with one sorry like a dragon <laughs> it will always be yakuza in my heart uh i, I can play that one-handed mm. and the rest of the time i'm just like sat there like doing my little stupid like stretches so that I don't have to get uh, steroid injections or uh, what do you call it? Or an operation on my wrist. Yeah. That would suck. That yeah. would suck bigly. I, but you, Jake, anything else? Uh, I So we actually kind of all, I'm looking like our list is kind of combined. Like you you wrote a bunch of stuff. Uh, so I'm going to steal one that all, all of you wrote. Uh, Rise of the Ronin. This mm. is Ooh. Team Ninja's. Uh, next big thing. I'm into this one because it looks like they're doing more storytelling. Uh, in a lot of the trailers and stuff, they showed way more like cutscene and story. Um, and also, I just love the setting. Mm -hmm. What is that? Nineteenth uh, century Japan, eighteenth century Japan, um, it's with Western influence and like you know conflict. It just it just seems really cool. Mm -hmm. mm. It looks hard. Yeah, though, I agree. So I don't want to play it. Yeah, it's it looks like hard. I wonder, like it's gonna kick my ass. My, I wonder how hard it will be because I mean, like they got a lot of shit for like Neo, for example, being really tough. And I know Wolong is is kind of similar. Um, definitely some of its early boss like checks as well were kind of tough. And then, I, but I believe Stranger in Paradise was a lot more accessible, broadly speaking, because I guess they were trying to speak to that Final Fantasy audience. Rise of Ronin seems like it's reaching for a larger audience. Like it seems it's got the open worldy thing going on rather than being a strict. I mean, yeah, Souls games are Souls games are open world as well. But I don't know. There's just something about this marketing that, to me, looks like it's reaching for a broader audience than most Team Ninja games have in the past. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if they took the edge off it somewhat. Because I like Neo, but that bull that difficulty was fucking bullshit. Yeah. Neo 2 it was, was doable. I, I got two was nuts. I got through it, but it was like annoying difficulty where it's just like, oh, all right, sure, this one trash mob can just immediately KO me with one combo. All right, fair enough. I mean, like, I don't know. There's always examples of that in certain games, but it just felt quite relentless in Neo. Um, so yeah, hopefully they take the edge off that here. I do think it looks fantastic. I love the open world. They got the glider. They got a glider, yeah. which is important in any open world game these days uh and yeah i just be cool i'm down what do you think about um, stalker 2 you have that on your list yeah so uh did you guys see the recent screenshots for yeah. stalker mm -hmm. looks pretty Mom's incredible yeah. pretty nice. um and like yeah i mean it's just obviously um like that setting that setup and we'll talk later in my show and tell block about oh. a book i read which is very important in the stalker franchise but um yeah, I mean, it just it just looks really... I'm down for that kind of experience. We don't get many, like, single-player story-driven shooters these days. It's kind of a rare... They're kind of a rare breed now. Uh, and the circumstances under which this game is being made as well is also crazy. Like, they're a Ukrainian studio. They have relocated to elsewhere in the world, which I believe the Czech Republic, yeah, um, to, like, finish the game. And uh, it's just crazy. Like, I just can't imagine making a game under those circumstances, let alone a game that looks this good and this promising. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really um, very excited for that one. Also, I'm excited I really like it's going to feel a little different, too, because if it has anything, any elements of the previous games, like, they're distinctly very PC games. Like, there's something yes. I can't quite put my finger on, but they're they're a little smarter. They're a little more deliberate. So I'm excited to see, like, the next generation of that so to speak mm, definitely definitely 
Uh, next up, uh, you also have. Pl- I want to pick your brain on Plucky Squire. Sure. I forgot about this yeah. one. Is this mm. the like kind of animated perspective shifting type of thing? Yes, where you're like going along a color coloring like a storybook, yeah. and then you hop out of the storybook and then you're in a three three D environment, and then you can like jump into you know like all those old lunch cans, like those old like lunch thermoses that yeah. have like cartoons on them, and you can like go around those and. Uh, I just think the art for this just looks incredible. There's never been a game that looks like this and is doing this sort of stuff with perspective shift. Um, the developers have been working on it for a long time. It's published by Devolver Digital. They put a lot of spend behind it in terms of promoing it. So I think they have a lot of faith in what this thing is going to be. Um, yeah, I just think it looks totally awesome. And, you know, it's uh, obviously it's all just the visuals at this point. We don't know how it actually plays, but mm. I'm really not expecting it to play particularly I'm not expecting a deep combat system or sophisticated RPG progression mechanics. I'm just expecting a really charming, cute game to play through. And if it does that for like six to eight hours and nails every single bit full of imagination, then I'll be like very happy with that for sure. Does it have a release date? Uh, I don't believe so. No, I don't think so. I think it's just coming this year sometime. So, yeah. Yeah. One other one I wanted to throw in was... Oh, you go, you go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna. I was gonna talk about Destiny. So please save me. Save us all. <laughs> please save us all. Uh, Interrupt me I, I by put all this means. On my most anticipated 2024 list, and uh, you know, I, I said some things. Uh, Alone in the dark. Um, oh, it could be. It, it could be a bust. Uh, but I am just <laughs> excited for Alone in the Dark to try to come back as a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's some potential there, and just like a regular old third person survival horror mystery you know spooky mansion type game is something that i'm always in the mood for so yeah i'm willing to see where it goes it was supposed to release last year last year's release schedule got so crowded and they they were pretty wise to be like we're moving that we're we're gonna come out later so but they moved it to january and now they've moved it again Again to, to when's it moved to now march i believe yeah. March. Okay, right. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I played like the prelude for that, like the very opening bit. Did you guys play this as well? No, no. I didn't. They did like a prelude-y thing at some point, and it was like, ah, uh, okay, I'm not sure about this. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, were you yeah. playing as David Harbour or Jodie Comer? Both. No, I think you were playing as like a kid or something at the oh, beginning. Oh, in this demo correctly. thing, yeah. This demo thing that they did, mm. yeah. And I was like, all right, let's see what's going on here. Uh, way too early to pass any judgment on it. Mm. Um. But, I could be totally yeah. like it could be, you know. It, yeah, it I know. doesn't look I, like I the most incredible game in the world. I'll say that. Yes, but like I don't know. I just I'm like, let's see, let's see what we got. Yeah, I agree. All right, um, so Ralph, are you looking forward to Destiny in 2024? It's it, it in a way, but it's like it's bittersweet, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm all but certain that this will be like the the last like it's the it's the the farewell to Destiny tour at that point, you know, which is gonna be kind of weird because destiny's been like a really big part of my life for like 10 years but i'm definitely feeling at this point that i'm kind of like ready to move on from the franchise you know it's like it's i felt that way with like world of warcraft for example where i put in like 10 plus 10 years and then i was like all right it's definitely time to stop doing this to yourself um (laughs) but my relationship with wow was a lot more destructive than um my relationship with destiny was they're very different games in terms of how demanding they are but yeah, I mean, look, nothing, it's not because Destiny sucks or anything like that. It's just because I've been playing it for 10 years now. And um, unless that game evolves considerably, I'm like, well, I've definitely had my feel of what that is. And I'm looking for new experiences at this point. And um, yeah, so I am looking forward to Final Shape. I think, I, I do think Bungie will do a good job of it. I really do. Um, there's a lot on the line for them. But then after that, I'll probably be like, all right, cool. Time to put a line under that, move on to the next thing and um, and then see what that might be. But I don't know. I, I also simultaneously feel like I'm probably never going to suit up for a game like that ever again. Mm. As in a game that I really invest in for a long period of time and it becomes like my daily driver and it's the thing that I do. I, I It's been really hard to maintain that connection to Destiny with this career because i started playing destiny before i was a youtuber right yeah and i was like sure i'll just play destiny all the time easy no worries it's like that this is my wow replacement this is what fills that void now no problem but doing this job you 
have to play the new hotness all the time you have to and it's a lot of hours obviously and it's just you constantly have to keep up with the grind and so trying to fit in a live service like that that's fairly demanding sometimes if you're wanting to do like the whole rating thing very difficult and so as i step off destiny it's not toward another game or even in search of another game like that it's kind of just like i will probably just not play those sorts of games anymore i'll dip my toe in mess around i'll probably still check out the expansions why not sure i'll do that just to like but am i going to play destiny as my thing going forward highly unlikely i think and i and i do believe quite a few people in the destiny community are feeling the same way a lot of people view this as the the farewell tour so yeah kind of bittersweet to be entering an expansion with that sort of feeling like Mm. usually it's like yeah hype exciting i'm so excited but i think a lot of people in the destiny community feel yeah a bit sort of melancholic about this release you know um so a bit of a funny one you sound like the the guy playing the violin on the titanic (laughs) (laughs) what does he say like uh like something cheery boys one one last ride my dudes (laughs) that's right yeah 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 (laughs) It's been a privilege. We turned to each other oh, before yeah. the last raid. It's been a privilege, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so, well, I, yeah. I still think that it, it, it'll be interesting to see because, like, I would assume that there's pressure on, right, for it to kind of be a bit of a grand finale or a swan song or, or no. Is Absolutely. it just kind of like, get it out, let's play through it and be done? No, there's definitely a lot of... Well, I mean, the pressure on Bungie is twofold. It's like, how do you have a fantastic finale that, clo- like, just, you know puts a bow on it and you look back on that last 10 year saga and you're like that fucking ruled hell yeah but also sets up for the future and gets people like invested in what the future could be Mm. and i believe that bungie will nail the conclusion to this saga but i'm not confident at this point that they really know where they want to take their game next to keep it alive for another 10 years it's a very hard challenge very few games can do that um Maybe Bungie can figure it out, but if they have figured it out or they're on their way to figuring it out, we just haven't seen anything about that yet. And I think part of the reveal, one part of the reason people are feeling the way that they are is because Bungie hasn't shown us any reason to think that there might be a future for the franchise. Yeah. It's just, it feels very, the final shape feels very final. Uh, and I think that's why it's a bit, um, a bit of a sad sad thing that's coming so yeah but we'll see hopefully i'm totally wrong and the final shape rules and it's got all this new shit in it that wants to keep like we keep playing it forever i don't know i'm curious know. to see how they open the floodgates to like whatever is next for the the franchise because that's that's a tough sell i feel like uh, it, it like it ends with like a like a big battle and the universe yep. is ripped open and you have Cade Six and Zavala and other characters that I also know the names of, and out <laughs> of the portal comes through steps there. Master Chief with his yeah. battle rifle, and he's like, "They gave yes. me back. Where's the fight?" <laughs> and then everybody loses their mind. Yes, absolutely. Three four three would love it as well. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be. Do, do you guys see that headline that we're like three four three kind of moving on from Halo Infinite? By the way, yeah, yeah Halo Infinite's content is going to be wild. I was so stunned. Yeah. If anyone doesn't know the detail, they announced that season five of Halo Infinite is the last season and they're kind of doing a, uh, like a operations model going forward, which is like mini content drops and like basically just a battle pass every four to six weeks. It definitely feels like a maintenance mode kind of vibe. Yeah. And they talked about how they're now working on their next projects. And uh, I was stunned. I was like, it's, it didn't really get much coverage either. Like it just happened and no one really talked about it that much. And yeah. Yeah, just the whole infinite thing I thought was meant to be infinite. I thought yeah. that was it. Like, that was the future of Halo. But obviously And I thought not, after it picked so. up a little bit of momentum again yeah, a couple of months back, that's exactly that was maybe... exactly what I yeah. thought. And then if you think those seasons yeah. are planned out, you know, maybe before that pick up again, you know, yeah, it would have been done months in, in advance. But mm-hmm. it's sad. Like, I had a really fun time playing Halo Infinite when it first came yeah. out. But then after yeah. that first season, or should I say during that never-ending first season definitely lost its luster and i'm mm. i'm sad like i just halo man it means something to a, us yeah it goes out with the women the old days did you, did you did you guys see the the halo actor in the tv series oh, saying saying I, I, I told him he's been saying some him. things he's been saying the sex the sex uh saying bad idea and we're like thank you and then finally he goes, did, someone did you see said what it. else he said he's like but yeah, if you think it's it. dumb that i take my helmet off the show's not for you i was like <laughs> Oh man, you, you had me you in the one. first half. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of agree with him about the helmet though. Like I do I think 
yeah, I don't. I think uh, you could do a Halo show where Chief never takes off his helmet. You could do it, but I think it's also fine that he does take off his helmet, yeah. so long as it's the right character. But this is not the right character. That Chief <laughs> sucks. He sucks, man. He totally sucks. And nothing to do with the actor, by the way. I think the actor's good. The actor's really, I really like good. That guy, in fact. but he's yeah, unlikable as a character. Yeah, Pablo. Sh- oh, Pablo Schreiber. Schreiber. Yeah, I think he's a great actor. I just think that he's not master chief at all you know and also the way he's written is also not master chief and the fact that he gets his fucking ass out is not master chief and the fact that he bangs the covenant whatever that's not master chief none of it is master chief like if it wasn't master chief that did it i would have been like nice dude that's sick (laughs) 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 uh speaking of xbox i do have an xbox game on my list uh hellblade 2 yay Uh, finally got a release day yeah yeah, I'm excited for that one. I've talked about that one a lot. I think I've talked about it here on the podcast. Um, I just like the style of the original Hellblade and now this one. There's not really that type of style in a game. We've seen that gritty style in some movies before, but I'm excited to see where it goes. And there was that new Xbox developer direct presentation. And mm-hmm. it's nice to just hear things about the game from the people making them and uh, just them talking about how it's set in like 10th, 9th century Iceland and like you're fighting giants and shit that's like everything i want to hear like that's so mm-hmm. cool yeah i'm i enjoyed that developer direct i think it <coughs> was definitely the the standout for me because i'm not a big indiana jones I, like i didn't really grow up with indiana jones and so i was more excited that it was a machine games title than an indiana jones game but the hellblade sure. section was definitely the standout for me it looks you know finally i bought a headset to play halo infinite with Got to enjoy that for about three weeks. And then my Xbox headset, I never get to use. So now I get to blow the dust off that and enjoy Hellblade and all the... What was it? Bi- bi- Binaural audio. Binaural, binaural. audio. Yes. Mm-hmm. If you've ever played uh, Hunt Showdown, that is binaural audio. Mm-hmm. And that's like... It shows the power of that. When you do it right, it's yeah. incredible. It's like... It's it's like it's almost too much, and there's a reason that not every game can use it because it's too much information for most games to want to like give you with your mm-hmm. with the soundscape. It's too like it sounds ridiculous, but it is like when you mm. fully experience it, you're like, okay, it's probably fair enough that like Fortnite doesn't have this or I don't know whatever game. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, but um, yeah, no, it looks cool. I mean, Broly, what did you guys think of that um, Xbox showcase? By the way, it's all right. Uh, it was right. avowed so is my question good. mark. Yeah, I don't know avowed. What the yeah. Avowed. I think there's a lot of stuff in avowed that looks really cool, but I think they chose the wrong things to showcase when it came to story. I think those bits yeah. felt really awkward because, yes. as viewers, we had so little context about those characters or what was even happening. Even though they tried to kind of contextualize it, I was like, you could, you could just show me zapping, just show me people getting zapped by electricity and fire. That's fine. That's all I need from this. Um, and I've never played Pillars either, so I was just like, oh, I don't know about this world. But um, I'm intrigued by it. I'm glad it's coming out this year. I do like my fantasy stuff, so I'm into it. Yeah. For me, it lacked the, um, you know, the combat I thought was pretty cool, and I like swapping the styles on the fly. That seems pretty interesting. Uh, where it's like, you know, you can have you can have a, a, a magic wand and a shield and then hit a button and then you switch to two swords and then you hit another button and then you're just casting magic with an axe. Like, I like that. That seems pretty cool. But then everything else they show, the RPG stuff, the Obsidian stuff I'm excited about, it must be hard to show in a video uh, because yeah. it was a lot of tell, don't show. They show a very quick dialogue tree and then they go, what you choose will shape the world. And like, there's no way to show that in a quick video, but like, I was still like, yeah. really guys. But the thing that didn't hit me is that I, you know, like when we first saw the outer, I have to say it slowly, the outer worlds, the obsidian game, when you first saw that, you were like, Oh wow, that's definitely an obsidian ass obsidian game. Mm. This, I didn't quite see that in, in, in some of the conversation and character stuff. I was just like, Oh, okay. I don't know yep. if Baldur's gate three ruined a lot for me. But I, I still need to, I just need to see more from it. I like Obsidian. It's probably going to be cool, but I, I need to see more. Sickest coo- uh, I, yeah. key art of oh pretty much God. any It was very game. cool key art, yeah. As soon as that popped up, I was like, oh, shit, that's cool. <laughs> it is good. Yeah, no, I, I'm the same with the bad. Like I, I Personally, I think the combat looks pretty meh. Like, first person 
melee sword stuff, spell slinging stuff. Like it's just very difficult to make it work in any case. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's really doing much here. It's kind of, and then they spend a lot of time talking about it. So I'm like, yeah, I can fling a wand. But I don't know. That's not why I play Obsidian games. It's for everything else. And yeah, you're right. You can't really show that very easily in a trailer. But I don't know if you spent more time letting me sink into this world and like talking about its factions and the tensions inherent and maybe one or two marquee characters that'll get, you know, that'll be a part of your journey. Like that's the kiss? part where I'm like, say again. Who are we going to kiss? Mm-hmm. Who are we going to kiss? You know what I mean? And it's like, and they're like, oh, your decisions will impact the play, the thing. And I'm like, of course they will. Like, that's a basic RPG thing. That's not very interesting. Uh, but I just, yeah, I would love to have seen more of that world and the setting and like sink into that rather than you will have a sword and you will swing it and toads will die by your hand. Like, I don't, you know, I, mean, I, don't, that's, I don't care. Um, but I'm still hopeful. I'm still, yeah, I'm still looking, looking forward to it on some level. Um, yeah, I think overall the showcase was, I don't know, yeah, it was definitely not as strong as last year's because last year's was when they had the Hi-Fi Rush Shadow Drop. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. And that, that showcase just, there was a few, I can't even remember what, else was in that showcase but i do remember walking away from it thinking fuck yeah that's a great showcase this one felt a lot more like eh, okay like the visions of mana and the aura history untold and which is my shit obviously. they said a lot of things you that like I wanted that? to hear. okay yeah. all right cool, it sounds cool. like they're rethinking some concepts and like how a civ game or or other games of that genre will play out so i definitely sure. want to try it but sure. i didn't i didn't expect to see indiana jones this year i expected a reveal but i didn't expect to see it releasing in 2024 i had assumed that Mm. they had kind of only just started working on that i mean i guess the last game that machine games put out was wolfenstein youngblood which was Mm. quite a while ago great i mean yeah mm. Um, (laughs) but you know they've definitely been cooking on this one for a while Mm. i'm like I said earlier, I'm more excited that it's a Machine Games title than an Indiana Jones game. I can take or leave Indiana Jones, um, and I don't have... That's the thing. I feel like because I don't have such a strong tie to the character, I'm like, oh, he's got the hat and the whip, and Troy Baker's doing an Indiana Jones voice, a Harrison Ford voice. Okay, I have all the touchstones I need for this. Like, Yeah. So. I don't know. It didn't. It didn't. Personally, it didn't really grab me. There's just I don't know the first person perspective. Is I, I don't particularly want to feel like I'm Indiana Jones. I actually just want to watch Indiana Jones. Like I, you know, I've never felt the desire to be Harrison Ford because I'm like Harrison Ford mm. is cool enough. I just want to watch him go on adventures. And so for that reason, the first person thing doesn't really appeal to me at all. And I would have much rather. And given that's like fisty cuffs, like that's his mm. thing, right? And first person fisticuffs is always kind of jank. It never really works properly. But third person, you can do a lot with third person like fisticuffs, right? And then they've got the the camera pulls back when you're doing exploration and climbing and stuff. It's like, well, you're doing a lot of third person as it is. I don't know. Like that choice seems a bit odd to me. I mean, if I'm running around with my Luger, sure. Okay. First person, whatever. But otherwise, yeah, that, that wasn't really popping off. But also like some of the facial stuff looked a bit waxy and weird and i don't know like uh, look i'm hopeful but i was not really like oh yeah hell yeah man this, this indiana jones this looks incredible yeah I don't know, Jake, you did a video i haven't watched your video yet how do you feel about yeah, it yeah i i went Haha. oh like i know <laughs> machine games is they make first person games and they're very good at making them but mm. i still was like expecting a traditional old third person indiana jones game so this can at least be different it can try something different. And I've heard some people talk about how, you know, machine games has people from like star breeze and stuff. So it almost has like this reverse, like kind of the darkness slash chronicles of Riddick thing to it, because it's like fisticuffs. And then it's also, instead of tentacles coming out from the screen, grabbing dudes, it's your whip. And then you're punching. Du- so there's like, it, it can be different. It can be unique, but what I came back around to it, even after the video I recorded, like thinking about it more is that like, I know that at at this point, new modern tomb Raider uncharted has kind of done the Indiana Jones thing, maybe even better than they could even hope to do it. But I think Indiana Jones and I think, uh, last crusade and him hanging off the tank, you know, fighting the guys. And I'm thinking of seeing that visual action, that physical stuff. And now 
I'm Indiana Jones and I'm just walking in first person and I see his little his little hands running and it you know yeah. it just doesn't feel quite right. But I actually like I totally agree. Troy Baker's performance. Um it's hard to get was, over you can't replicate Harrison Ford, but it sounds like he really understands how Harrison Ford speaks. Just like the inflection, a lot of the like weird sure. behaviors in his voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. I mean, I have a lot of opinions specifically about Harrison Ford and how old he is and how <laughs> often he is in things that I don't, I don't need to get into as a, as a sure. Star Wars fan. But yeah, man, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I love how he was just like, uh, just kill me in the first movie. Yeah, okay, I'll do I'll it, but you have check. to kill me in the first movie. <laughs> yeah, That's he's the like deal. that for Star That's Wars. Deal, and George. Indiana Jones, he's like cr- in tears at the premiere. It's like, you clearly like one of these guys way more than the other. Yeah. And Han Solo is yeah, cooler yeah. than Indiana Jones. I'm sorry, are we all agree? Is that like a hot a hot take? No, I do not agree. I think they're equally what? cool in their own way. No, I, also, I don't agree. I also feel like Star Wars fans are more are going to be more annoying than Indiana Jones fans. Yeah, that's probably true. I'm great. I, agree I don't know. A that. lot of Indiana Jones fans have. I'm gonna. No, I'm gonna get. No, oh, gonna hello! Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say they have their little leather jackets, and they're like, "I'm Indiana Jones too," and it's like, "No, you're not." <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon that's why Todd wears a leather jacket? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Do you reckon that's the inspiration for it? For sure. Oh man. Do we yeah, have right. any other so, 2024 games we want to highlight before we move on? No. Nothing from me. Space Marine 2 is the only other one, which I think looks sick. I played the preview. I loved it. Um, I think it will be a very cool video game when it arrives later this year. Mm-hmm. That's that's about it. I'm excited. That might be the one to finally make Get me you. a... Make me no, a Warhammer weird, weird nerd. Guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely not one of those people, but I dabble. I like dip my You've toe. you some and of the books, I, right? Yeah, I have. I have. I've read some books and played some games now. And like, but I'm not one of those people. Like, and you I respect read the, them. Uh, fine. You read the books. You're one of those people. Excuse me. Let's be clear. I do it as a tourist. Okay. Like, I wish I could say that. Vo- I actually really like Warhammer. Mm-hmm. I think it's cool. And I wish that I like, that it was like more in me than it actually mm-hmm. is because I really do like it a lot. But I also am res- like, there's there's this thing where I'm just like, okay, cool. I don't want to make this my personality <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> like I've, i don't want to start painting the figurines it's just something that i enjoy whenever i come into contact with it but i'm mm. not going to be seeking out like lots of it do you know what i mean because mm. warhammer is a lifestyle if you want it to be. oh like, that yeah. is absolutely a thing um so i'm not going to go full henry cavill as as much as as, a, as appealing as that might be you're hitting the gym you could paint warhammer <laughs> in the you gym, could go build full my own pc and read warhammer books for sure absolutely. basically the same person <laughs> <laughs> i i struggle to spot the difference absolutely that's what i tell people all right next up we are taking a user question uh remember you can send your questions to contact at friends per com. anything you want to ask us or anything you want us to talk about feel free throw it in there into into our inbox void we appreciate you uh this comes from tim s who says dear fps Happy user here, wishing all you a happy new year. A happy new year to you as well. Have you ever had a game that you played growing up that just clicked with you immediately? For me, it was definitely Devil May Cry 3. I don't know how I got my hands on that in middle school, but here we are, I guess. Uh, Yeah, I hope you all have a good year, and I wish Ralph the best of luck with his final shape review. (laughs) Sincerely, Tim. Also, P.S., Lucy, please tell me you saved a VOD of the Outer Wilds run. I need my next blind run serotonin hit. <laughs> good good news, Tim. I haven't started yet, but I will. Don't go. worry. I'll good. put it. I'll stream it. I'll put it on YouTube. Don't worry. You Outer Excellent. Wilds people are, are different. We are. We're mm. fucked up. So a game totally. that you, you played growing up that just clicked with you immediately. Uh, I'm going to... So I, I always talk about Metal Gear Solid. I always talk about Resident Evil. I'm actually going to go on what Tim said. He said Devil May Cry 3 for him. Mm. I am a thousand years older than him. And for <sighs> me, it was the original Devil May Cry, which yeah. hit me like a lightning bolt. I was like, you can be, number one, a cool guy. Number two, a cool guy with guns. Number three, a cool guy with a sword also at the same time. Number four, he's uh, like a demon. Number five, it's made by a Japanese development studio. Number six, it's from the Resident Evil guys. Like it just, (laughs) for me, it was everything. And I was obsessed with it to the point where I was frustrated at school that none of my friends were talking about it. 
So I had kind of compelled myself to make my own fl like flyers about the game, like almost like a little video game magazine. <laughs> like I made a little mini magazine that I was going to like disperse to my friends. And I like cut out a cool picture of Dante from Game Pro and I fucking <laughs> glued it on. And I was like, you guys got to see how cool Dante is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And uh, I didn't have I didn't have the nerdiest story I've ever. <laughs> Did you like show your mom? <laughs> Absolutely. She's like, "That's very good, Jake." She's your like, friends the will legendary love Dark Knight. Who? Spa what? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Is that, that how a, your mother talks? That by that the way, Is that her accent? I was like, I understand this game. This game understands me. And uh, my favorite is still the first one. Sure. Lucy, That's what cool. about you? I think in terms of a game that I immediately understood would be Lemmings. Again, much clearly much older than Tim. I would play Lemmings on the PC and it was one of those games where it empowered me to be creative with puzzle solving in a way that I don't think I'd really experienced before. Like my dad had a lot of a lot of games and we would play an, a, a rally game that I can't even tell you the name of now. And I was like weirdly good at it. But I don't think anything really stuck with like it clearly didn't stick with me because I can't remember the name of the game. But Probably Lemmings Colin McRae rally. Sorry. I don't was know it? if it was. It was like it had a blue car in the front. Maybe it was. I don't know. Oh, I, I'll, wow. Next time, next time I go home, I'll, I'll see if I can dig out the disc. But you gotta get your dad on the pod now that we know he's game. Yeah. yeah. I want to hear about his like. Yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, I'll message him. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Funny. He's retired. Yeah. He's got a lot of time. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. but no and so lemmings was creative problem solving for me at least it was kind of like this cute little gateway game because the sprites were very cute and they played those tunes and they would go oh no if you're gonna blow them up and stuff and also <laughs> they kind of fed into a, sadis a sadistic side a little bit which is weird to say but you know, you would do your best to save them, but then there were the, those ones that you would cement in place, and then at the end you'd have to blow them up, and it would be kind of like, tee hee, how many of these can I get away <laughs> with killing? Or you know, watching them jump off the side and and squish themselves. So that's a very <laughs> weird and unusual answer that gives me. Uh, Tells us a lot about you, Lucy. Yeah, I was gonna say you can see your <laughs> interesting side to me, but I really enjoyed Lemmings. Yeah, uh, I think for me there was there was a few. But I think one that really stood out was like Heroes of Might and Magic 2. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys played Heroes. Did you guys play that back in the day? Heroes of Might and Magic? God no. damn, man. I played so much of that fucking video game. It's, uh, if anyone doesn't know, it's old school strategy game where you have a little character that you... Or a series of heroes that you move around a map and you move to certain tile, like certain spaces to like pick up a little bit of treasure and you move to a little barracks thing and you can like recruit some troops and you have to fight these like turn-based battles on whatever um, classic series that is still alive and well today in terms of people still play the old releases quite a bit. It's quite timeless. But um, yeah, for some reason that was the strategy game that I really, really sunk a lot of hours into. More so than like your, I, I loved your RTSs, like your mm. your Red Alerts and Command and Conquer back in the day. Um, but that one was the one for me in particular because I could play it with a mate and we would actually kind of sit together for hours on end. And he would just like, and I would always control and he would just kind of tell me what to do, you know, because he was like smarter than me. And so, you know, he had he was like the the the, the, the tactician and I was just like the clicking man. Um, and we would just sit there forever and his mom would make us nachos. And that was like the best thing ever oh, when man. you're 12 years old. Like, mm -hmm. hell yeah, you get nachos delivered to you all of a sudden while you're sitting at the PC playing this game for like eight hours. And sometimes I would go over to this guy's house. And we, I stayed there for the whole weekend. And from morning to night, for two days straight, we would do nothing but play Heroes of Might and Magic. Oh, I love that. And then I'm, but I'm like, I'm also at now, and I'm like, was that very good parenting? <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, should we be allowed? Should we be allowed to have done that back then? Back, I'm sure parents back then were just, thank God they're quiet and they just yeah. they're upstairs and whatever. Um, I absolutely yeah, did was, that with my friends as well, though. Like we would play C yeah. Caesar three or something on the yeah. iMac and just. Be it, don't just you wouldn't hear from us. That's all you do, and you just do it forever, and it's nice. Like playing co-op strategy games, mm. w like couch co-op strategy games, is a thing you mm. can do. We don't really talk about that now, but like you can because you're sort of just making decisions together, and you talk it out, and like come up with strategies and go this way. And that. I don't know. I just I really loved that a lot. So yeah, those were those were nice times back then. Ah, 
Simpler times. Thank you, Tim. Simpler times. Questions. Better times. Yeah. This episode of the Friends Per Second podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Boys, it is the run up to Valentine's Day. What you got cooking? That's weird. Well, That's weird. How much? How much detail do you need, Lucy? <laughs> I mean, come on now. Like, come, that, is that appropriate to ask? I regret saying that. Is- ask <laughs> when we're doing a manscaped read. Is that really the question you want to ask? Come on now. No. Carry on. <laughs> Jake, you're a regular manscaper, are you not? Mm, yes, I am. I think <laughs> for the Valentine's Day season, not to be gross, you want to be clean upstairs and downstairs for your loved one make a good impression so thankfully manscaped offers a lot of stuff to do that you can be trimmed up you can smell good uh the biggest thing of course is the lawnmower 5.0 ultra which ralph i believe you do have on hand uh that is the handy dandy device for grooming your downstairs business it's got a yes. led spotlight on it so you can see where you're you're aiming <laughs> Do you call it aiming when you're shaving? I do. You definitely call it aiming. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. Uh, sure. It is precise. It is water resistant. It charges nice and quick. Uh, All their stuff is really, really useful. They also offer cologne now. Uh, There's the Manscaped Refine Cologne. I actually, do you know they also have, I don't know if you've seen this, they have like an electric shaver. Have you seen this one? That's no. this, you know, like no, 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 like, like, no, like a, like a, those electric trimmers, you know, like the ones with, bzzz, like, and you shave your beard, like, do you know those like square ones? Oh, they do. They do, yeah. It's called uh, the handyman. That's what it's called. It's called the handyman, and it's actually fantastic. It's great. I actually use it when I travel because, like, I don't know, I, I don't have to shave very often. Like this right here is like maybe two, three days of growth very slow right and so i can just kind of use that really quickly to kind of like sh- sh- tidy myself up a bit without having to do a full shave it's like usb charged it's like water resistant it's really durable it's called handyman pro and yeah i really like it so that's a manscape product by the way this is not just some random thing i'm talking about <laughs> this that, is an actual manscape good thing. because like you can be all if, if you are the type of person you can be shaped up you can be clean you can be nice totally for your date that's important that's right you gotta you gotta exactly get that right. going for sure well, in the lead up to Valentine's Day, get 20% off and free shipping with the code FRIENDS at manscaped.com. That is 20% off and free shipping uh, at manscaped.com with the code FRIENDS because your grooming upgrade awaits, ready to charm your Valentine's dates. <laughs> okay, time for another commercial break. This podcast is also brought to you by Incogni. Now, I hadn't actually heard of Incogni the last time we spoke well, because you guys had kind of used mm. the service, but I hadn't. And so since then, I did use a service and I'm like, damn, this is really fun. Good. So the way it works is that Incogni essentially runs an automated process to start pulling your data off the internet. Because over the years, you would have signed up to a million different places, like uh, click yes to sign up to that and this and that. And then a lot of those places that you signed up to actually just forward your data onto other companies, other data clearing houses, and it just gets spread around everywhere. And you can actually request to have your information taken down from those places, but you have to go through a whole process to do it. And no one, you don't even know where your data is most of the time, okay? Incogni just kind of automates it, where you just enter some personal details and then it starts trawling the internet for where your data is. And it will just automatically start issuing these requests to these organizations to take your data down. And so my, and you also get reports when Mm. it's doing it. And so my latest report says that it's got like 70 claims currently active and that like 43 of those have been resolved. So there are now 43 less companies on the internet that have my personal data now than when I had, than like two weeks ago when this Mm. process began, because it does take a little bit of time for it to roll through. But like, man, that is awesome because yeah, like I had, and looking at the list, I had no idea how far my information had been spread around. I was like, what is this company? What is that company? But yeah, they have my data. And so I'm like, well, not anymore. You don't now, thanks to Incogni. So I think it's really good. Genuinely really surprised at how useful that is. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. How are you guys tracking with that it, stuff? It's really valuable just for privacy, security. Yeah. You know, it really helps with that stuff that is very important in this mm. day and age. It also just kind of cleans up your, you know, internet presence so to speak yeah it, it, but the best part for me was just the set it and forget it type of thing mm-hmm. you sign up you fill in your information and then you sit back 
and just watch it go. And it's not overnight, but that because it's a real process. It is going through the motions mm. and sending these basically takedown requests to all these companies. And yet the game changer is also helping reduce the annoying ads that follow you around the internet. Incogni lets you browse without leaving breadcrumbs for advertisers. I know that I will look at maybe one thing on Amazon and then get plagued buy that ad uh, for totally. weeks afterwards or I'll buy a toaster Months. and I'll, I will keep getting adverts for toasters <laughs> and a lot more. Uh, but Incogni, it's not about blocking ads. It is about making the internet about you again. And we're not just tossing around buzzwords. Incogni is kind of like your secret ally, ensuring that your data stays where it belongs. And that is with you. So there's no more dodgy data trading or surprises, like Ralph was saying. And as we've been seeing our, seeing our reports come through, it's like, I didn't yeah. know they had my data. No idea. And I'm really glad that you don't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, for our users, we have a great deal. If you head over to incogni.com, use the code friends per second, and you'll get an exclusive discount of 60% off. So reclaim your online space with Incogni. Use the code friends per second for 60% off. Next up, another user question. This is from Kuan, uh, if, if I'm pronouncing that, if that's the Irish pronunciation. Uh, Kuan asks, hey guys, is there any trope or mechanic you'd like the game industry to forget? I really dislike rarity systems like green gun, blue, you know, etc. And compulsory parrying. I gave up on Lies of P because of it. All the best this year. Yeah, that's uh, definitely. Um, is can I just say souls likes in general? And that's like a hot oh, no. You no, cannot you say can't. souls likes. <laughs> okay, that is not. What does the that question. even mean? What what element that of is souls not likes? What he's asking. The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> you shut your like, mouth when Elden Ring trope? DLC comes out I'm gonna yeah, play it yeah, right. come crawling yeah, back Lies of P2 yeah, I'm there will. day one baby but <laughs> I'm also tired <laughs> I want to play a game that's easy and nice to me and I don't need to work hard to see all the cool stuff so is that the trope then like the souls like thing where they don't give you adjustable difficulties is that what you would change yeah like just that you know the whole brutalize you thing to teach you to get good mm. you sure. know and, and and also being uh, it's hard to explain uh I, I i dug myself this hole can i say i also <laughs> just agree with uh rarity systems forced into games that don't need them uh i'm sick of endlessly picking up a gun and switching it for a new gun five seconds later because it's 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 glowing orange instead of blue yeah redfall really did a number on me with regard to that. God, that was so bad. Never mind. We're not going to talk about it. Talk about it. <laughs> Mine would be um, weapon durability. Oh. If okay. I had to think about one, I think sometimes I would just... I, I don't mind the option. If I could turn it off, that's fine. But I think sometimes <coughs> I'd, just, I'd just really love to... I'm, I'm the type of person who... I'll get a particular weapon. I'm like, yeah, this is my end game weapon, <laughs> you know? And if you give me the chance just to upgrade a weapon from the beginning of the game to the end, I would much prefer that rather than having one that can potentially break on me or need to get repaired all the time. So that's, that's mine. And I don't, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I would just, I'd, I'd be happy without it. Yep. Me, I'm, I'm, I'm encumbrance, just delete encumbrance. Mm -hmm. No, there's no game that wouldn't be improved if you just didn't delete, like if you just didn't delete the encumbrance system. Uh, and so it's been killing yeah, it me sucks. in Power World. I've been playing Power World, and I've it's, been like, "Fucking God!" It's like you need uh, yeah, twenty stone to build this, and it's like I can't walk. I know, and it's <laughs> annoying because you've got, you've got an inventory, mm -hmm. and then you've also got encumbrance, and it's just like just fucking pick one. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's just it's just annoying, and it's just I don't know. Yeah, because those was games. Rough. I'm Through playing. I played another survival game recently, and it had encumbrance in it. And it, like immediately, as soon as I started playing, I'm encumbered. And I'm just like, "Come on, man! I don't want to have to go into my memory. Split stack. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need. I've split tent. Oh, Boring. I need. If I if I drop one rock out of the stack, I can then ha move. But if I only drop, if I don't drop, you know, I, oh god, I just get it so annoyed thinking about it. So, uh, delete it. I think as well. Starfield had it, which I hadn't. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, all Bethesda games have it. A lot of people complain about encumbrance in Starfield. There's a fly here. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's just a really shitty mechanic that just really blows, and it's anti fun, and it's just hanging out in your menus doing boring bullshit. So no, thank you. I'm I'm good. 
Every game should have the active reload mechanic from Gears of War, even if it's a game yeah. without guns. <sighs> should is that true or not? Let's think. Yes. I want to actively Probably. reload my sword. Okay, no, that's not true. I don't think it should be true in like, for example, Hunt Showdown or games that are like really trying to lean into their realistic weapon mechanics. Like, should Battlefield have that? No, it shouldn't. But should Halo have that? Yes, it should. Mm-hmm. That'd be sick. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. Sick I agree with you. I agree with you on that for sure. For sure. That was a great question. Yep. Thank you for that. That really got us mm-hmm. thinking. Yeah. Uh, okay. Again, you can send questions to contact at friendspersecond.com. Now, we got to jump into uh, another catch up topic what we've been playing. We've been playing so much, sort of, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, so definitely. can we just jump in with Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown? Oh, I really like so this one. Good. Like, I didn't expect like, I I was like, yeah, this seems pretty cool, but like I didn't expect it to be this good. Mm. It's been very interesting because I've only played up to the first boss because mm. I've been playing I, other stuff during my break and whatever else, but I have definitely you know played through that part. Um, and yeah, absolutely love it. Um, I think it's really interesting to see how much people love it and how like vocal they are about that. Because seeing the chatter online, it's very much just like, damn, man, people are straight up saying like, this is one of the best Metroidvanias Mm -hmm. ever made. Like they're just out there saying that right now and no one's really disagreeing with them. Everyone's like, yeah, I see that. And who'd have thought? Like this is just a, it's a Ubisoft game. It does come from um, the studio that did the Rayman series because Mon- so obviously they have yeah Montpellier so they have a lot of um pedigree in the 2D space but the style of it the combat have you seen the comp some of the combo videos that are doing the rounds that mm-hmm. you can do in this game it's like devil may cry shit the fucking combo is nuts you, you know what I mean mm-hmm. and that is not a feature that is present in Metroidvanias Metroidvanias typically have very basic combat models but fairly sophisticated traversal um, like mechanics. Mm. But this has both of those things and it combines like really good, snappy, interesting traversal stuff, especially with the time shift mechanic, as well as this kick-ass combat system that lets you do so much nuts. Oh man. So yeah, seeing the way that people have responded to this is amazing, especially given how much people hated the game at first when it was first revealed. Mm. It was like, this sucks, it's terrible. To see the turnaround like that is such a really, it's a really nice feel good story. There's so. something to the movement that makes getting around and like clearing, you know, like a Metroidvania where you're like, you're like, I'm going to go back and clear out this section of the map, find hidden stuff. The, the fluidity of movement and everything you're doing, it kind of might like different, different like genre, but it, it feels to me like dead cells. Like when you're really sure. tuned into dead yep. cells and you're dashing down, you're dashing forward, you're jumping up, you're attacking up, you're dashing left. Like you're just bam, 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 bam going through that feels so good here and i love that and then like if you Mm. combine that with like you doing that around enemies in combat and then also getting those like really stylized parries that make you feel really cool it just Mm. it just scratches a lot of itches the story Mm. i could barely tell you what (laughs) was going on but it had a couple of cool ideas in terms of like time stuff um that like i i just so just generally like but the style of gameplay like I think that if, and and they've tried for a while now, right? With Prince of Persia to try and get their shit together. It's been rebooted. It's been soft rebooted. They've done this. They've Mm -hmm. done that. Uh, They haven't really found anything totally consistent after, what was it? Sands of Time, Warrior Within, Two Thrones. After that, it kind of just like fluttered around with different things. This, I think, can be the future of the franchise. Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. makes sense. This is Origins in its roots, the mm. original 2D game. And it's so good that I think they could really take this and run with it. I know some people don't want to hear that. I love Sands of Time, but like mm. I just don't see Ubisoft making like a new Sands of Time. I know they're doing well, they're the re- remake. They're remaking but it, but that, like, you know. It's... I just think a lot of that territory... Sorry, Lucy, you go on. Go on. No, I was going to say, it's just nice to see Ubisoft taking a bet on a smaller title like it reminds me of back when they were doing valiant hearts child of light rayman origins and it would be you would still get these big blockbuster assassin's creeds and tom clancy games and whatever but then you would have this team these teams who would make these smaller tighter adventurous games and i think in particular the thing that makes prince of persia lost crown so special is because 
clearly this is a team who understands uh, movement, game feel, yeah. and Metroidvanias. And they've done everything to coalesce all of these things into a game that is approachable. Like it is, it's one of those great ones where it's like if you're a fan of the genre, you will love it. But if you are not, and so I've never really been a Metroidvania kind of person. Like I really enjoyed Ori, but I, I Dead Cells, I guess to a degree, oh, that's roguelite ish But you know, never really got into Castlevanias or whatever. But I really <coughs> kind of wanted to, or, or Metroid even, because so many people love them so much. And I think there are so many smart things in this game that make me empowered as a player. So, for example, when you go to the map. You see the castle, the the whole the whole castle. There's a, there's a picture there, and then as you explore more, like the detailed map kind of comes up on top of it. So you you get a sense of place from the very get go. They do the Resident Evil thing of the outlines changing color depending on whether or not you fully explored it. There's fast travel mm. in there. There is the ingenious picture system where. If you want to come back to an area later and you're kind of going to forget where that is, you take a picture of it and it just puts it on the map for you. You can adjust the difficulty setting so you can skip some of the traversal puzzles if you want. It's like very cleverly engineered to just be, and this sounds very weird for talking about a video game, just to be very playable. But that's Ubisoft games, right? Mm. And this is the thing. We shit on Ubisoft games because of their, like, Ubification mm. and, like, their homogenization and how overly designed they feel. And I think that is true because, you know, we, they've been putting out a lot of Assassin's Creed and Far Cry games for a lot of years. And, you know, that's just what they do, right? But over that time, that's that publisher and the, and the developers in there have gained this skill set where they really know how to design things that are accessible that have like mass market playability for a very large number of people very like a lot of systems that make it easy to pick up and play these video games it's just the most of the time a lot of that is applied to stuff that we're kind of a bit bored of at this point right mm -hmm. but here they're like well how about you take all of that that knowledge and that like the institutional capability of ubisoft to design these highly playable games but you put it onto a game that's actually mechanically very clever and well built and unique and original and that is a cool combination right and it's like it's a great picture into what publishers could be doing mm -hmm. like imagine i've used this example in the past like imagine if sony santa monica had a little spin-off team that made a game like this for the god of war franchise mm -hmm. like how fucking sick would that be that'd be amazing you know what i mean um yeah. apparently they did that a little while ago like ages ago or something for like i don't know whatever psp or something was there it was like a 2d psp um, oh there was a god of war game there was a mobile game as well yeah oh was it a mobile game no, or i think like i think anyway. a P you're right with psp but there was also a whatever. random oh, yeah. mobile game um but yeah but the point is that ubisoft's strengths are this streamlined design thing it's just that they're not pushing mm. design other other aspects of design but clearly they've been doing that here with Prince of Persia, and it's a really great com com um, combination. Because, yeah, picking up and playing it for just a few hours, as I have, I had exactly the same um, observation, where I'm just like, God, it feels great to play this. There's the quality of life stuff. That all of that is so clever, you know? So, um, yeah, do more of this, Ubisoft. Mm. This I agree. Yeah. Lucy, do you want to take the next one? What else have you been playing? I've been playing Like a Dragon Infinite oh, Well. Oh, man. I'm the one I wish I had time for. Yeah. Yeah, I'm forty some hours in. Uh okay, so it's a very big a very big game. And, you know, starting off with the story, there is longtime Yakuza protagonist, uh, Kiryu, who is dying. And Kiryu has been the lead know, of Is that a spoiler? That seems like that's in the, that like set up. That's in the trailer. trailer. Oh yeah. Okay, fair yeah, enough. like it's That's a big deal. It's that's a sad. big, big deal. Um Kiryu is the stalwart good good boy. He's he's kind of found himself in the Yakuza, but he has a heart of gold. Yeah. And then there is Ichiban, who <coughs> was the main protagonist of like Yakuza Like a Dragon, the last game where they took it from being a brawler to being turn-based. And Ichiban is still has this heart of gold, but he is, and I was explaining to Jake, he is so earnest. He is a, a himbo. Like <laughs> and he was also sent away for years for prison for a crime that he didn't commit and he gets out and he still remains this light-hearted person who wants to help everyone and in this game the two of them are uprooted from japan and they go to hawaii to solve a mystery and i'm not going to go into into too much but they are working together uh kiryu has 
risen to the top of the ranks of the Yakuza, left turn, left the Yakuza life behind him, working for uh, a bunch of spies. He was an agent for a bit. Uh, he had a different name, uh, like Suzuki. And then uh, now he's, you know, kind of, he's at the end of his life and he's reflecting on everything. And so seeing those two bounce off each other and it's very much feeling like this passing of the torch moment where Ichiban is still so naive to the ways of the world. And you see that at the very beginning of the game because he gets taken advantage of and just, he, he's so trusting. And then there's Kiryu who has lived his entire life in service of others and is kind of trying to be there for Ichiban and encourage him to be this great person that he knows he is. So the story immediately pulls you in and I I would say a lot of people have said do I need to play this this and this if you can play any Yakuza games I'd play Zero I'd play like uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon and you could you don't have to play a man who erased his name watch it the ending on YouTube and then you can get into this one easily but I think you could start with Like a Dragon and then get into Infinite Wealth the thing is that so many of the Yakuza games are set in kind of the same area of Japan yeah. going to Hawaii is incredible because I'm playing it in Japanese and it is very funny to see how they have caricaturized the American characters. <laughs> so, for example, when you're walking down the street and you get into some random battles, there'll be like this guy who just yells, hey, I'll sue you. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's great. They are really, really funny. And, That's perfect. And, and the Hawaii is where, um, I know Gene Park has tweeted about, you know, as someone from Hawaii, how much research they did into kind of the gentrification of the of uh, everywhere and how the people who actually are from Hawaii can't even afford to live there anymore. I can't really speak to that, but I would go check out Gene's stuff. I would say taking taking everyone, but taking and keeping the Yakuza zaniness has been really cool and it's been really fun to explore a completely new area while still kind of dipping your toes in the others um, and seeing how their adventures kind of translate to being in Hawaii and dealing with way more American characters. And the thing I think that I love the most about it, this is kind of a little rambly. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't really think this through. I'm into it. Keep going. Keep going. The thing I love about uh, Yakuza games, not just the the melodrama, the zaniness, whatever, is the way that things tie in to each other. And I think with Yakuza Like a Dragon, they really nailed this. And it's something that you also see in Persona games where everything you do has an impact on something else. And it is incredible to see how these systems, A, make sense in the world, but also feed into the battle systems. So every every enemy in Infinite Wealth looks like a kind of fantastical version of a grunt. So there'll be... Um, twitchy streamer who's a guy who's trying to take pictures like they're, they're just normal dudes but when you go into battle because Ichiban is and this is canon he's such a big fan of Dragon Quest he is a hero battling enemies and so already you've kind of you're elevating this from just being random encounter to being something wackier sure but then every time you walk around and you have a conversation with your squad mate that increases your bonds your bonds increasing changes how they behave in battle they'll combo with you more they'll follow up with you more you can do special moves together as long as your bond is bigger uh, a bit bigger and better uh the jobs you do the um uh dialogue choices you pick all feed into ichiban's uh personality meter doing those will unlock different uh you, you change jobs by going to a Hawaiian uh, tourist place called Alo Happy, which has the most fucked up uh, character in it. He's like this guy dressed as a tree and he just dances at you weirdly as you're changing jobs. But that's how the job system works is you go on tourism things in Hawaii and, and you unlock a job. Those are gated by Ichiban's personality. Uh, you walk around Hawaii and there you just hit the X button if you're playing on Xbox or PC and you say hi to people because there is a system for Ichiban to be friends with people. Uh, he basically has a Facebook. There is, um, <laughs> by completing... It's crazy. By completing sub-stories, you unlock new characters for pound mates, which is a system where you call people in, when you're in the middle of a fight and they come. It's like a rent-a-hero delivery service. They come in and fight with you. You can then go to Dundoko Island, which is Animal Crossing, but you find elements for that in the real world. And then when you uh, 
uh, make your resort better on Dondoko Island, the more people come and visit you, you get money that you take back to Hawaii. When I say that everything fits into each other, it's insane. And it Mm. feels so right and so good. Like in Persona, building up bonds with your friends, doing things that then tie into your school and then, you know, that all ties into whatever. This feels like it's on another, another level. Sorry to say it. But that was a story. So I'm really enjoying it. I'm not at the end yet. So okay. I have been very much taken through with it. It is the classic Yakuza Like a Dragon stories where it is full of drama, full of um, people teaming cool up. Faces. Cool faces. Yeah. Like it's everyone is impossibly cool. They're all teaming up uh, to get to the bottom of this mystery. There is, there's going to be betrayals. There's going to be enemies who are just impossibly cool and you're you're kind of fighting them and hunting them down and you get taken to the dodgy areas of town and you're drawn through it with these characters and they're all i think the only one who's not really resonating with me too much is tommy zawa he's just too much of kind of like an every guy for me whereas there are people like obviously kasuga and um or ichiban and and kiryu who are way more i don't know just something easier to latch on to and then there's adachi and nanba and um I'm not going to say any more for risking of spoilers, but you know the, there are these really strong characters that draw you through, and that the whole the whole reason that you're over there is because you're looking for Ichiban's mother, and so that's the through line that pulls you through because you are trying to find Akane-san, and everyone else is too, and you're you're also trying to figure that out. I will say I have seen a couple of people. Michael Hyam reviewed it for us at Gamespot and said that it didn't stick the landing, so I'm kind of worried about because I'm chapter twelve of fourteen. And I will say, I know it is, it's a JRPG. There's going to be grinding sections, but you know, when you are ready for an emotional beat, like everyone is kind of getting ready, being like, oh, we've got to go do this. This is going to be the big battle. Are you ready? And then I was playing it and I was like level 34 and it said recommended level 41. And (laughs) I had to go grind in this dungeon which is i assume a procedurally generated one it's very similar to mementos in persona 5 if you played that and it's just a really boring dungeon and that's the thing that sucks that sucks and also there's not just one of them (laughs) i was like no if you're gonna make different ones at least shush it up a little bit yeah Yeah. but overall there is so much in there to talk about and I don't want to kind of monopolize the whole podcast, but I'm really enjoying it. I, I've already cried once and I haven't even finished it. Sure. There are some really memorable side stories. There are just really fun, over the top. Like those games know what they are and they know how much they can push it. So they have these big moves that everyone has these like special moves and they are just ridiculous. Like, um, one of them is a guy who's a like puts people in a walk and cooks them and you know it's it's so stupid and then there's you know there's the pokemon snap game there's the pokemon mini game there's the animal crossing game there are all these other mini games including like a doordash uber eats one there are sega games in the arcades like when it says infinite wealth it's basically like we're giving you infinite content infinite content to keep you in there sounds like they've done it again the mad lads have done it again at rgg and I'm just... And this is the first game that has the new, like, without the um, old series lead. Like, the, 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 the director for the series, he's gone and started his own he new has. studio. Um, so this is the first one without him, right? I believe... Well, I guess... I don't know a how man, much, man who involved. changed his... Uh, man who erased his name, I guess, wouldn't have had him Okay, either. right, sure. But that was, yeah, like, yeah. But, I mean, right, this is right, a main, right. main entry. Sure. Oh, and I, like, last thing on it, because I could go on for 40 odd hours um (laughs) the combat is my favorite it's ever been in like i think one of my favorite battle systems maybe ever which is huge to say cool i was never a big fan of the brawler stuff i've said it before i have really bad repetitive strain injuries so those kind of repetitive movements are not very fun for me and that is what the older yakuza games are built on they changed it to be turn-based for yakuza like a dragon and then in this one, they have made these really great subtle tweaks. So you'll combo, the, like if you get a, if you hit some, an enemy at their back, it pushes them forward. And if you push them into a, a teammate, they'll then hit them. And then you can maybe angle it, so like hopefully it angles up right so it goes to another teammate. And then they smack him or follow him up. So you can pinball dudes. 
you can pinball dudes. You can also, you have the pound mates um, that I mentioned earlier, bringing in those extra uh, people to fight for you. Um, the new jobs are really, really fun. Like there are some that are definitely themed around Hawaii. And as well, there are like ridiculous ones like being a desperado or a samurai. The desperado, my man is just dressed like John Marston as well. It's great. Nice. Um, cool. There's so much to enjoy in there. And I'm I'm really happy I got like all of the the good scores that Accolades. it did. Because it's great. Yeah. It's really fun. I'm sorry. Every time I hear every time I hear people talk about Yakuza games, like a dragon, or whatever, mm. I'm always just really sad that I'm not at the point where I'm caught up to be able to do it. It's just like, it's been going on for years now. It probably will continue forever, but just always makes me sad. Like, mm-hmm. cause they always sound so excellent. And I played Ishin last year and I mm-hmm. really love that. Um, a lot. I didn't enjoy judgment, but whatever, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, just seeing it and clips and whatever, the little of it I have played, I'm always like, damn man, that just seems like a really awesome series and yeah. it'd be great to be able to invest that time to catch up, you know? Yeah. They are very mm-hmm. special. Mm-hmm. Thank you for mm. sharing. Welcome. Yeah. Was, uh... <laughs> Sorry, I felt like I went up for so long that my voice went out in the middle of it. But I was like, that was good. That's was exactly like, what I wanted like, to hear. Please tell your friends about this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. You should make a little uh, magazine about it. Like cut out a picture of um, <laughs> of Ichiban and stick it around, <laughs> and then like give it to your friends at the playground and be like, "You got to play this game and see what happens." You know. I might just. Yeah. Yeah. Ralph, what do you got? So over the break, I played Armored Core, or at least some of it, and um, I really love it. I am always trying to find a way to get back to it because right when the work sh- when the work began, I had to like put it down again. <clears throat> but um, yeah, it's just it, there's something to it in terms of the way it looks. There's, it's just there's something very special about its framing of action. Some of the encounters that it's some of the boss encounters, and it, and also like the the layout of levels is really interesting because they're very low in detail in terms of like the visual, like, you know, textures or whatever. It's very gray. But if you look at these levels as kind of like these monolithic stadiums that house this like combat spectacle, they really start to take on a very different, they're very imposing. And just like the architecture of, of these environments is really quite striking. And so I just, have really started to love the visual framing of the game. Plus I started to like customize my mech quite a bit and I went from being fairly mid range to being very light. And that's been just super fun to experience just how, like how different that is. Um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've definitely found it tricky, but not super tricky. It's actually quite well pitched in terms of difficulty, I think. Um, and yeah, I just really love it. And I'm just looking to play more of it. I'm, I'm going to be busy all February, but it's very high on my list of like stuff to get back to in March. Um, but the work game that I've been playing recently is Enshrouded. And yeah. uh, Enshrouded is a survival game. Um, I think it's it's one of the most wishlisted games on Steam right now. And were it not for Power World, I guarantee you we'd be talking about Enshrouded a lot more because the PR cycle would be building and you know people would be paying attention to it and games media outlets would be pumping it. But it's it's there's a lot of hype behind it from the survival community, the PC gaming community, whatever. It is a survival game, but it's more it's actually more of an action RPG with survival elements. Ooh. So imagine like Zelda slash Elden Ring crossed with Valheim. That is essentially what this is. And that on spec is a fantastic pitch. Yeah. And I will tell you right now that it's getting a lot of the elements of the formula right. Mm-hmm. You know, there is a massive world to explore. It is dense with things to discover. There is a genuine sense of exploration and discovery as you move through it. You are constantly being like drawn to places like, you know, you want to go somewhere, but then you see something in the distance and you're like, well, shit, I'm going to check that out. Like, and that's fantastic. There is a glider in it that allows you to move through environments really quickly. Um, and there are actual towers that you climb that you can, you know, then mark Uh, locations on the map and then you sort of have to go and check them out but it's not an objective focused game Mm -hmm. like you're not ticking off markers like a ubisoft game those places are just places you can visit it's a much more free form kind of adventure um it does have like a very light touch story that's mainly told through like you know lore entries and that sort of thing there are some npcs that you kind of free 
but they're not really great for story either they're more about like opening up new capabilities at your base so you'll find the blacksmith and now you can do blacksmithy things back at base and you'll find the alchemist and of course you can make potions that sort of thing right um but there is some effort toward a story um but overall the main story is going to be like you moving through this world and exploring this space and just seeing it because it's gigantic like i spent 30 hours on this during the early access build and i reckon i got through maybe a quarter of the map maybe i reckon a full playthrough of this is 100 plus hours when the full game releases just based on the size of the map alone it's fucking gigantic to the point where unfortunately i just i think it's a bit too much right Mm. and what i mean by that is that like it is trying to be Elden Ring in terms of the lands between and its size, but it's not as interesting as the lands between to explore. And it's trying to be Zelda with its dungeons and its co- and its like lock on combat, right? But the combat isn't great, and the dungeons do get a bit repetitive pretty quickly. Um, the survival mechanics is a really interesting one because it's a very light touch approach to survival. You really don't need to engage a lot of the systems. The focus is on staying out in the world and just adventuring and finding stuff and whatever. You are not being asked to spend huge amounts of time in your base doing very manual work. But it's kind of tuned a little bit too lightly. And so there isn't enough tug at you with those survival mechanics and you kind of just ignore them a lot of the time. And it just makes that sort of game, that part of the game feel a little bit superfluous or peripheral, you know, where I think it should be a little bit more central. And in absence of a really great story and an absence of a really deep combat system and an absence of really cool dungeons and an absence of survival mechanics. Like it's, it's good. Don't get me wrong. I I like it. And I've had a really fantastic 30 hours with it. I really have. And I've been playing that solo when it's actually intended to be played co-op up to 16 players co-op, mind you, like that's a lot, but I just, I really believe that I can't see how this lives for a hundred hours and if this game had like a 50 to 60 hour horizon and was really tighter, was much tighter and more focused, I don't think you would become as concerned about the systems as I am right now. Because I'm like, I'm 30 hours in, I'm kind of feeling on my way where I'm like, you know, I don't know. I, I'm like, can I do 70 to 90 hours more of this? Absolutely not, right? So I think a bit more restraint and a bit more focus would result in a better product but they're in early access so it's possible they can add a whole bunch more stuff that broadens the game and deepens those mechanics and adds new cool bosses and whatever but um right now i think it's a very promising very interesting survival game that i think is going to do really well and i think people will really like it especially if you're playing with other people but i do think it's surface level mechanics are stretched far too thin across Mm -hmm. this game it's just it's just it's just a bit too much at this point so yeah Mm. that's entrouded man yeah it's good though like if if, you've been talking about it for a while like i want to have it's been on my radar it's like it's a thing if you can wrangle in some people i guarantee you you'll have a good time for 10 15 20 Mm. 30 hours and i think that is all and it's like a discount indie title whatever if you can get 30 hours of fun with your mates out of a game that's already a great starting point right um but it's the other stuff and like the longer term stuff that I'm not as sure about. What was the reason? Is there, can you pinpoint a reason why it was so wish listed on Steam? Was there some thing about it that like really. S- survival games are always big, man. They're just always big. There's, uh, I learned long ago to oh, always yeah. pay attention to survival games because it's just a thing. Like our caveman brains, we love cutting down a tree and then using it to build a house. Mm. We love standing over a fire and making and like, you know, cooking the boar meat that we just that we just hunted. It just works for our brains. And so any survival game that's decent, like uh, if it's an, a shitty asset flick, ignore it, whatever. Mm. But if it's decent and it's actually got some proper, you know, talent behind it, some proper effort, it is always going to do at least something on Steam. Like it's always going to do numbers and if it's looking promising, it's going to do big numbers because, yeah, survival games are just like that, man. They're always big. But, but to not to sell this short as well, mm. this has this looks fantastic. It is it is a beautiful looking game. It's one of the best survival games I've seen. Plus, it's uh, it's voxel based, so the all yeah. the terrain like Valheim can be just manipulated. And this is easily the best looking voxel game I've ever seen for sure, hands down. Um, and that is in itself That's huge, big. you know. Yeah. So. 
there are a lot of reasons why this has some, a lot of hype behind it. And they're all legitimate. You know, they, this team has put in a huge amount of work. I think it's a team of about 40 people based out of Germany. Um, and they've done really great work here. And I think that, you know, if you spent 18 months to two years ironing this out over, over an early access period, you could come away with a genuine like survival all timer. Like, I think it's, it's that, but yeah, um, there's definitely quite a few things to, to do along the way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Shroud of Tata on PC exclusive to PC commencing Gen- like tomorrow wait yeah, well actually it's already out by the time this show is out it's already out so yep. yeah my review will be up for that as well by the time this video is out so you can check it out if you want more detail I played through the uh, Last of Us Part 2 PS5 update mm-hmm. uh, it was a thing if you own it already it was like a $10 upgrade for PS5 features and uh, a new mode uh, which is actually very cool. Uh, it's like a little roguelike mode. It lets you run around and just like kill people as Joel or whoever you want to be. And it, very cool. Very cool little addition. I like that it isn't like... I, I like that they're not making you go out and buy the whole game for full price again. Yeah, um, This update, I know a lot of people probably will want it for just for free. Uh, you know, other other game studios have done similar things for free. There's that. Um, the upgrade doesn't really feel like too much other than dual sense support. Um, the game had already been updated to have 60 FPS at a point. Now it's rock solid, so that's that's fine. Um, and playing through it again has been nice because I've just been taking my time with it instead of rushing for a review and knowing that the whole world is burning down both uh, pandemic and discourse. This time around, it's like I'm just playing it casually. So I don't know, nice. man. World world kind of feels like it's burning down. Still. It's always burning down. That's the, as <laughs> as you get older, you just realize it's always burning down. Um, but yeah, I think the only thing I've realized in my second playthrough, uh, nothing profound other than that. I I think about you know two hours into the game, getting uh, pressing triangle on every little thing and opening every little drawer and taking bullets out gets so tedious and monotonous and <laughs> kills the momentum of the rest of the gameplay and really cool encounters <coughs> and good murder um so yeah i think the last of us part three if they ever make it it needs to just have auto collect or something because oh please oof. can you imagine that'd be so yeah. good yeah so good that's mine it's been nice to play through it again just like an, a story adventure you know say what you will about that one yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you, because you said you mentioned God of War, Ragnarok, Valhalla earlier, because I did mm. the same thing where I played Valhalla, but then I played The Last of Us, uh, whatever their mode is, and I think doing it that way ruined it for me, because I really enjoyed The Last of Us Part Two's combat. I was really struggling to get into that mode because everything in Valhalla had a purpose and it had a storyline that took me through and you know doing the loops made sense narratively whereas in this one it just kind of felt very disjointed it it was just playing for the sake of playing also i said this on gamespot after dark last week why the fuck is manny the last guy you unlock (laughs) like why is he the last the last guy like why would it not be joel or someone (laughs) you know know. like main cast but no manny is uh manny's the hot ticket i don't remember which one was manny i can't remember manny exactly (laughs) <laughs> Which one was Manny? Which one was Manny? No, I think I had to ask. I think he's he's part of Abby's crew. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I was like, but he's like the last character you unlock after everyone else. Okay. The That's reason so why strange. I like the mode is because I would watch guys on Twitter who do those like gameplay clips sure. where they're just playing oh, flawlessly as like, like Sunhill Legend. Ellie, and- you're like, yeah, Sunhill Legend, like where he's like jumping off of a balcony, stabbing a guy, diving, John wicking and shooting somebody else. Mm-hmm. When I play through the games, I, I play very carefully and I'm like in the mood and I'm like, oh, I'm sneaking around. I got to be careful. I can't die. I can't die in the video game. But <sighs> this mode lets me just fuck around and throw Molotovs at people while running and being like, fuck you. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I liked it for that. No, no not like fine. a long term hold my interest for hours and hours and hours thing, but a cool little addition. Where mm. as Valhalla, I really like from a story standpoint, it did a couple little things, acknowledged some things that I would have liked to have seen even talk about uh, being I, things I would have liked to have even seen tackled in the main game uh, yeah. from God of War 2018 and Val, uh, Ragnarok. 
uh, Valhalla acknowledges a lot of like Kratos stuff that I've wanted mm. acknowledged and talked about. And it does it in a really cool, fun, simple way. It's absolutely worth playing through if you like those games, but I think even more so if you like the old games, I'm still very much like ride or die for those original games. And I think the... I'm still working on a video. I haven't put it out yet. Um, I, oh, I you can do a video. Footage. Cool. Yeah. Um, nice. But it it, uh, it reckons with, you know, some of the goofier stuff from the old games mm-hmm. while also kind of, you know, making a point that like the older games weren't just like edgy, you know, edgy cool guy murder simulators. They had a little bit of something to them as well. They did. Um, yeah. So I, I, I really liked how this acknowledged all that his past just did some cool little things with it just a good simple mm. playthrough a couple hours i don't know how many what was it, it was like five six to seven to seven five hours to, to do everything in, i think i was like really into it yeah sounds about right yeah. yeah yeah it was fantastic i was really blown away by that it was um yeah when it got revealed we're like oh, okay they're gonna do a cheeky little roguelike mode yeah. it's free so it mustn't be much whatever good on them that's nice then you play you're like wait what the fuck is going on here you know and it's a really nice surprise. And I'm just so, so stunned they gave it away for free. Like, if you charge me 10 bucks for that, I'd be like, yeah, that's a very fair price to ask yeah. for what you've mm-hmm. built here. Like, I just, I would happily have paid that. Very odd that that is, um, you know, free. And then obviously Last of Us Remastered is paid. I mean, look, yeah, obviously Last of Us Remastered had stuff too. Of course it did. It had a new mode mm. and it had, um, and it had the director's cut stuff and a visual upgrade, which was kind of minor, but whatever. But I don't know. Yeah, I think Sony Santa Monica could have charged for that, and I don't think anyone would have batted an eyelid. It would have been a very reasonable ask, mm. I think. So also yeah. this one, like more than more than the main game, even there's like a little bit here. They let Christopher Judge like act. Like yes. They oh, yeah. really let Definitely. him like go, and I'm Dude. like, wow, the Kratos in this DLC has a lot more to say about himself than he does his own damn son in the in the, in the base yeah, game. He does it's cool? He does. It's cool stuff. Yeah. It's good to see. Yeah. Oh boy, uh, you have Suicide Squad kill the Justice League written <laughs> down. So I assume you uh, played the Alpha period. I did. I played the Alpha. Oh, look, I won't talk about it for too long because I think everyone's kind of sick of hearing about yeah. this game at this point. Um, but look, Suicide Squad. Um, <laughs> God, how do you sum it up? Um, I, I, it's fun. It really is, and mm. I and I guarantee you. When people get their hands on it for themselves, they're going to be like, yeah, sure, this is fun-ish. And I don't know how long people are going to want to play this for. I'm not sure. Some people are going to say, are going to say I love this. I'm going to put like the full 20 hours into it. Some people will be like, oh, yeah, I want to play this for 500 hours. I, I don't think there's going to be that many people but in that category, but whatever. Some people are obviously going to have a few hours of fun with it before they get bored of the combat. Because it is, I don't know, the combat is not its strength, not from what I can tell. Maybe it gets very different later on. But looking at various late game, you know, end game gameplay clips that Rocksteady have recently reviewed, I don't think it does. So I'm not hopeful about that. The story stuff, though, is very good, I think. Like, they really are nailing it. They're just the... The, the presentation of the Justice League and the Suicide Squad and the gang and whatever, they just revealed a new Joker, uh, like Joker, Joker from Elseworld Joker. And his gameplay actually looks pretty cool. But the reason for that is because he's never firing any guns in those clips that they released. Mm. <laughs> and that's why it's cool because he's being the Joker and he's doing Joker things as opposed to just shooting a random nondescript sniper rifle, which ultimately is what this game is based on. So um, my prediction for this hope i'm wrong is that it's gonna have a cool campaign but then after that it'll just that's it we're done you know there'll be obviously a select group of people who stick around for the long tail live service but i don't have high expectations for that but if i get a good 20 hours of this with some cool storytelling and some silly co-op action i'm happy and whether that's worth 70 dollars, fair enough everyone's got their own price points for that right but for me personally i will be happy with that offering um, I will be disappointed that it wasn't another Arkham style game. You know, if it wasn't channeling the same creativity and focus that I think the Arkham trilogy did. But look, what do you do? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, they had to make a game. Whether they chose to make it or were forced to make it, I don't know. But it just it is what it is. So, um, but yeah. But look, I, again, I suspect Suicide Squad will be fun. That is my hot take actually because (laughs) saying nice things about this game anywhere online is going to get you into a lot of trouble but um 
Yeah, it's out soon, by the way. But the, it, the early access starts on the 30th of January. So, you know, this this will go up over the weekend. And then just a few days later, um, it'll be playable if you pre-order it. Otherwise, it's available February 6th. So, yeah. That's it. Wow. All right. Um, all right. Let's move on to this new segment we have. Uh, it's called Show and Tell. Uh, this is some we're gonna try and like always just you know, there's a little palate cleanser, bring a little something to the table that we've enjoyed that isn't a video game. So I would like Lucy to start. What have you been enjoying this week? Technically cheating because it is a little bit of video games, isn't it? But <laughs> it was GDQ last week, which is uh my favorite. I I sometimes fall to sleep watching fall asleep watching speed runs. Uh, that's no slight on speed ones. I just find them very interesting to watch, and they and I, I find them relaxing in a very strange way. Sorry, uh, this is games done quick. Games, awesome games done quick. And so this is the the January one. They've got summer games done quick as well, and um, I think they had like an all female games done quick actually not too long ago. And there were some really really cool runs, as there always is. But I I, I tweeted this out actually a couple of days ago, but like. Uh, I can't always watch them live, like I'll be at work or I'll be going out. The post-production team on GDQ this year just went above and beyond. Like the runs were up super quickly. All the thumbnails were really good. Everything was time stamped. Like it used to be back back in the day when you would watch like some of the ones that would like the archive on the YouTube channel. Some of them, if you go back and watch like the really popular ones, the runs wouldn't start until minutes into the video and they've actually gone through and cut them. So it's, Hey, I'm X person and I'm Y and like everyone on the couch and everyone commentating has a name badge and stuff. And so looking at what the uploads used to be compared to how they are super impressive, really great viewing experience. But there is, there are some runners that are just like, I think all speed running is incredibly interesting because it is just a way that my brain doesn't work. I want to play the game the way it was intended. And so watching some of the runs, like the Blanks's um, Lies of P run and the Mitrit's um, Elden Ring run, where they have to be pixel perfect to execute on these jumps. And it's, and, and it's like, not only is it really difficult to do those, and they have to kind of restart sometimes just because they might not have nailed it. It's like, how the hell do you even figure out that that does that? Yeah, how you figure out the i think the, the lies of p run he skipped like six chapters by jumping a special way up a building <laughs> um and That's so rough. if you even if you don't have an interest in speed running if you just like video games and you've never watched gdq please go and check it out on youtube those are the two of two of my favorite runs from this gdq uh the resident evil 4 remake run was also very fun it's also really nice when they have folks who who also speed run the game because sometimes you'll get people i think mitritz is the perfect example of this he's the guy who did the blindfolded sekiro run from a couple of years ago i actually interviewed him and i was like how the fuck do you do that and he was like sound how does he do that sound uh, it's uh some of it's sound and then some of it is um like counting the number of dashes because he knows that John Sekiro will dash a very certain distance and then he he does one move and he turns the other way to be a, a like a specific it, also I think when he did that he couldn't hear as well as couldn't see because he had to listen to the game so he had little Aggie doing the commentary but anyway he that's fucked man oh yeah it's insane like he couldn't he couldn't explain what he was doing but because he had someone on the couch who knew the game and knew what he was doing he had that commentary and the thing with Mitritz is that he's a really great commentator, like not only when he's playing, but also when he's on the couch. And I think that's so important to explain what the moves are, how, who discovered it, like the the history and the context of the communities that find that stuff. Mm. It's so cool. I love GDQ. Um, that's that's my show and sell this week is please go watch GDQ. Wow. That is cool. Yeah. I, uh, I... I have to admit, Ooh, I go. don't I don't have anything. Oh, okay. I was gonna say I, I thought you had something because you were like I'll I'll come back to it. But. I came I came unprepared. I uh, I don't have anything other than I watched American Nightmare on Netflix, Ooh. which is a three episode crime documentary bullshit thing. Like there's a million of these, and I'm not usually a fan of them. Mm. Uh, but this one I was interested in because I I, I actually kind of knew the story. 
and I wanted to see how, like I followed it in the news a couple of years back and I wanted to see how it was portrayed. Uh, and I thought it was pretty good because it kind of had a little bit of a happy ending where mm. it's like there was a good cop, the murder was solved, everybody lived happily ever after. And that's good sometimes. So, which, which <laughs> crime was it that they were? It was the Gone Girl. That It's like the oh, Gone yeah. Girl type thing that happened <gasps> in real life oh, geez. Um, from a couple years back. So I liked it a lot because so I scroll through the, the streaming services and everything is a show now. And it's like, oh, that's an interesting documentary. And you click on it and it's 10 episodes mm. that are like three hours long. And I'm like, no, I can't. I wish. But no, mm. I'm a gamer. Mm. All right. I got, I got <laughs> shit I, I got to do. Span. So totally. this was only three episodes and they were each like 45 minutes each. Mm. And so I was able to blast through it and it was interesting and mm. I liked it. It's called American Nightmare and uh, it's not something I usually normally ever recommend, but uh, it was it's an interesting story. Mm. Nice. It's mine is not this, but I actually watched Squid Game over the uh, holidays. Whoa, oh, yeah. I never watched season, time I watched season it. Season two's out this year. They said. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Today. You got to watch it, man. It's so it's good. good. Like it's it's very... Like it's exactly what you'd expect. Even it's removed a, from like the disc, it's still good. Oh, absolutely! Because uh, I had no spoilers. I came yeah, in totally cold, anything. and um, it's fantastic. Like it is, it's you know, it's very um, procedural in some aspects, uh, and yeah, definitely very tropey. But like, man, it's just got some fantastic moments in there that really just make you go fuck, and they just. They're just yeah, it's a really well written, well made show, and I just really loved it. And um, I won't spoil anything because obviously it'd be cool if you can check it out. But definitely make time for it because yeah. uh, we just watched it on a bit of a whim, and I was just like, "Damn, man, this is a great television." No wonder it took off as much as it did. It was it was really good. So, um, but yeah, the thing I actually uh, did recently was um, I read a book. It's called Roadside Picnic. So, um, when I did my preview for Pacific Drive. Uh, I just saw general commentary and a lot of people were like really surprised that he didn't mention roadside picnic. That's an obvious touch point for this. And I'm like, roadside picnic, what the fuck is that? So anyway, Googled it and, um, this is my own ignorance. So, you know, there it is, but I had never heard of it. And, um, it is a novel written by two Russian brothers and it was written back in the seventies. Yeah. And it's the story of what if aliens came and they arrived And they just hung around for a very small amount of time and then they left and they left all this junk behind, Mm -hmm. right? And to us, it's like, it's this magic shit that does incredible things like perpetual motion devices and weird types of endless batteries and like acid that's fucked up and does weird stuff and like gravity traps that like, you know, gravity just doesn't work properly in in these certain spaces and all sorts of weird shit. And we don't know what it is as humans because we just don't get it. It's like mm. if you give a iPhone to a dog, it doesn't understand what that is, you know? And, and that's kind of what that story is. But it's really focused on people called stalkers. And this is where we start to ah. like get the video game connection. And this, this these brothers actually introduced the word stalker into like kind of the Russian language more broadly, um, referring to these types of people who, you know, go into the zone to fish out um, these artifacts and they, because they're being protected by, uh, by a big institute, which is obviously very like, you know, reminiscent of like Soviet era bureaucracy and what have you, but they have to like sneak into this zone and they get these artifacts, these, these alien objects and smuggle them out and sell them on the black market. And they, these people are called stalkers. And it's just a really fascinating look at, well, what it would what would it be like if aliens came and then just didn't really talk to us and they just fucked off? And what would it mean to like reverse engineer their technology without any of their guidance? And what would what would the government apparatus be around all of that? And how would people respond in the nearby town where that happened? And it's just brilliantly written while also having this concept of stalkers, which directly influenced obviously the stalker games. But more recently with um you know, with Pacific Drive, it's the same sort of vibe. It's mm-hmm. like you're going into this place. Re- you're not meant to be there. It's locked down. There's weird shit around that you're meant to collect and bring back and repurpose. And you don't quite understand what all these things are, but you know they do something. And it's just a brilliant novel, though. Like, the characters in it are so good. It's so incredibly well written. I just really loved it. I, it's one of the best books I've read in many years, I would say. Wow. And um, And it's short as well. You can smash through it really fast. It's you know about seven or eight hours to read 
Um, and yeah, you'll love it. I just think it's really good. And with Pacific Drive this year and Stalker later in the year, it's good prep for that as well. You know, just to like get in the mood. Um, I really recommend it. It's it's fantastic. So yeah, it's a good pitch. Pacific mm. Drive, and there's a movie as well. It's called Stalker, so it's kind of ah. based on on um, sorry, not Roadside Picnic. Mm. It's it's based on Roadside Picnic. So yeah, awesome. All right, sweet. Yeah, that was that was our first first annual show and tell. I think that's a good way to start it. Uh, yeah. and that's it. We made it to the end of our first episode. Uh, I am very excited for the remainder of this year. We got some cool stuff planned. We're very excited to. Uh, let's just say, please be excited. As yeah. <laughs> the fa- the please look forward one. to it. Yeah, please look please forward to it. Please look forward to it. <laughs> um, yeah. So you can follow us on social media. That'll all be linked. Uh, rating us on the podcast platforms really helps, and we very much appreciate that. Thank you for all the kind reviews. Mm-hmm. They go a long way, both in our hearts and also for the almighty algorithm. Oh, Cheers right. to you guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see you guys not this week, but next week because we're a fortnightly podcast. Mm -hmm. That's Skill Up. That's Lucy James. I'm Jake Baldino. Tie your shoes and go to bed. Mm